Good evening. Welcome to the Bellevue City Council meeting. It is Tuesday, October 20th, 2020 at 6 p.m. Uh, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the invocation. Uh, Associate Pastor David Leidick from Midlands Bible Baptist Church is here. That's at 2407 Chandler Road. So please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor Hike and members of the council, thank you for maintaining this practice of opening in prayer. It's always been needed, but I think it's probably more so today than ever before, so I commend you and thank you for it. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for the privileges and the liberties we still enjoy as a people. We thank you for our state, for our county, and for our city, for these men and women here who lead us in the business affairs and the matters that concern us as a people. And I pray, Lord, tonight, as in each and every occasion on which they gather, that, Lord, you would impart wisdom. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally. And Lord, I pray that you'd impart that here tonight. And again, not just the intent, Lord, to make some decision that would be politically expedient or uh, beneficial in some way in that regard, but Lord, there'd be a determination and a commitment to do right. The Bible says again, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So we pray you'd just give them a special uh, again, ability of discernment and a determination, Lord, to accomplish that which would please you first and foremost, that which would be a benefit to our citizenry. So we commit the affairs here tonight to you, and we'll thank you for what you're going to do. Praise you for it now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Leidick. I'll call the meeting to order. Susan, would you take roll call? Mr. Stinson? Here. Mr. Cook? Here. Mr. Shannon? Here. Mr. Preister? Here. Mr. Burns? Here. And Ms. Welch? Here. Thank you, Susan. This meeting is conducted in accordance with the Nebraska Open Meetings Act. A copy of that act is located on the rear wall of the council chambers. Uh, before we get in, I just want to introduce a special guest. Uh, haven't been able to do that yet. So uh, Colonel Alan Dayton is with us. If you'd raise your hand there. I'm only one in uniform. I can't hardly see you. It's camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Dayton is the uh, 55th uh, Mission Support Squadron Commander. Um, he's kind of our contact uh, uh, with the city. So uh, if we have questions or they have questions, uh, he's, uh, he's our main contact and it's uh, it's been a privilege working with you, and uh, we appreciate everything you and your troops are doing for our country. Thank you. Item five, uh, approval of the agenda, consent agenda, claims and advisory committee reports. Councilman Shannon. Oh, may, yep, go ahead. 5A, approval of the agenda. I will make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Shannon, second by Preister. I'll make a motion to amend the agenda. Moving item 16C after item 10. Moving item 14B and 14B1 after item 16C. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Shannon, second by Preister to amend the agenda. Moving item 16C after item 10 followed by 14B and then 14B1? Yes, sir. Any comments or questions? Please vote on the amendment. All voted yes. Thank you. And we have a motion by Shannon, seconded by Preister to approve the uh, agenda as amended. Any questions? Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. Item 5B, approval of the consent agenda. Items marked with, 
marked with an asterisk or approved where this item is unless otherwise removed. Councilman Cook. Thank you, Mario. I'll make a motion we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Cook, seconded by Pricester to approve the consent agenda. Any questions or comments? Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. It takes us to item seven, special presentations. We have none tonight. Item eight, organizational matters. It says we have none, but it looks like 8A. Uh, 8A, recommend approval for the creation of the City of Bellevue Sidewalk Construction and Maintenance Task Force. Um, Councilwoman Welch, you want to say anything about it? Um, just that uh, we need to put together a task force and the reason of a task force is because it has a beginning and an ending and what this is is start looking at the sidewalks, lack of sidewalks and implementation of sidewalks within the city of Bellevue per the ordinance that is already out there. Yeah, we uh, had some ideas on it, but we thought it'd be best off to get everybody's input before we uh, before we put some kind of ordinance out there. So that's the reason for creating the task force and getting some of the city people, maybe some of the community stakeholders together. I think what, what we're gonna do is put the task force and get it all implemented and then present it to um, invite the community to come in to look at their um, suggestions. And one of the reasons I want to head this is because I am one that does not have a sidewalk. <laughs> so I'll be affected just like the rest of the people. Uh, would entertain a motion? Oh, Councilman Freister. Well, I just want to make a comment. Do we yeah, need that, the motion first, I suppose? Yeah, let's, uh, do we have a motion? Okay, anybody want to make a motion? Councilman Cook. I'll make a motion we approve 8A. I'll second it for discussion's yep. sake. Motion by Cook, second by Burns. Now we'll have discussion on it. Councilman Pricer. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'm just wondering about the length of time and the involvement. Uh, my concern is we've been talking about sidewalks for the time I've been on the council for 12 years, and it was a topic for probably 20 some years before that. And we've got items on the agenda today, including a development where people are concerned about kids walking to school and no sidewalks. So I'm okay with doing a task force, but I'd like to know <clears throat> some parameters. I'd like to know that we're moving faster than we've moved for the last 30 years. And we've got some things in, in motion already through our public works department. So I'm just one, I'd like to hear where all that's fitting together and how we're going to do this because I don't want this to delay things even further. And you know, Councilman Pricer, I appreciate that. The, the plan is to, you know, we have, there is an ordinance on the books, am I correct on that? Okay, that, set, that states that sidewalks need to be- The um, no requirement of the property. Requ requirement of the property owner, but there, Bree, can we talk about that ordinance that brought all this forward? Yeah, I'll pull it up while you're talking, Kathy. Um, so what the ordinance basically stated, and correct me if I'm wrong, is once a homeowner um, put the property on the market, sold it, then it needed to be, a sidewalk needed to be implemented. And the concern, the reason for the task force is you have, 20 houses and number 15 goes under contract on the market and they have to put a sidewalk in, but number 16 and number 14 don't move for 20 years. So there is no sidewalk on that type of property based on that ordinance. So the plan is to do a sidewalk district where sidewalks are put in um, all at all in one area at one time. And so we have to do, get everybody on board within the city as to how we implement that, how that gets paid for, all those types of things. And then we do have people that we annexed last year and they don't even have a street. 
They have gravel, gravel streets and drainage ditches, and it doesn't make sense to put sidewalks there if we don't have that. So we need to reevaluate that. We also need to look at, in my particular street, um, the other side has, would be better for a sidewalk, and I, it doesn't make sense structurally to put a sidewalk in because of landscape parameters. And I know the boulevard has places that there's just no way you could put a sidewalk in there. So should my neighbor pay the full brunt of this or should we split this? These are just things that we need to talk about versus the implementation of this and just making it happen. The other concern that we had was you have a, you know, how do we make sure that the realtors know about this so that they can advise the homeowners and you get a realtor who doesn't sell houses very much in Bellevue and you get to the closing table and you say, Mr. Preister, did you put the sidewalk in? And you're like, I, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about a sidewalk. And I say, well, I'm not putting in a sidewalk because I didn't know anything about it either. And it could blow up the deal, which it actually happened to Mayor Hike on that particular instance. So I think it's more of a, um, sidewalks will get put in, but it's a matter of constructing a method, um, a process, and implementation of making it happen is the purpose of the task force. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense, yeah. and I hope that we can move expeditiously because I think Many of those questions are already answered and Public Works has many things in the process. So I'm, I'm hoping we can move rapidly. Thank you. I would agree. Uh, so, Councilman Burtz. Yeah, so um, just hearing everything said, a couple things is, is, yes, there was an ordinance and I think we're all aware of it, has not been introduced, um, at least publicly on an agenda that my understanding was is a new sidewalk would be put in and that would be a negotiation between buyer and seller. The reason for this was is it was the best, it was at least progress and it was at least a step in the right direction. Um, I will tell you is, is with this task force, I am, I'm with Tom Preister. Um, I, I think that the time for talk is kind of done. Um, I think sidewalks are pretty black and white um, you know, I, I have a little bit of a bias. Maybe you can say that, um, but I do live in um, Old Town, um, and our, our sidewalks are bad. Um, some of them are non non-existent. Some of them um, are new because of grant money for school routes, um, and those are connected to old, decrepit sidewalks. Um, you know, and a, a couple of couple issue is, is, you know, we have COVID-19, we have a lot more people walking, we have sidewalks that are not ADA compliant. So if you're blind, deaf, you're in a wheelchair, um, a lot of our sidewalks are, are, are not good to be on. Um, if you're elderly, um, I will give you an example. And I also stated this publicly. Um, I did have a neighbor and I did witness her fall. It happened pretty quick. Um, and luckily she somehow maneuvered um, into the grass and that was just a cracked up sidewalk right across the street from my house. I will tell you, I have a nine month year old son and I will tell you it is more beneficial and a lot easier. Well, it's not beneficial. It's easier to walk him in the street than to walk him in our sidewalks. <coughs> we have already approved, I believe, two sidewalk improvement districts. Nothing has been accomplished. Um, I just think that there's been a very big lack of leadership. It looks like we are in, uh, we are, we have an opportunity to actually do something. Um, and I think a task force, to tell you the truth, is just a, a more way. It's, I just think we're de delaying the process. Um, I think we should just really pick chunks at a time and, and start moving forward. And as issues arise, I think we can deal with them. But as Don Pricer said, I, I think a lot of these issues have already been resolved, talked about, and discussed. So, Councilman Shan. Okay. So the ordinance we keep talking about is a proposed ordinance, not an actual ordinance. Okay. Right. Just for clarification. Okay. And a task force needs to have a stated goal and time frame. So, is the goal here to? create the proper parameters so that the ordinance can come forward as a proposal or what what is the 
goal, stated goal of this task force and time frame? Well, the um, stated goal is to get sidewalks in all of Bellevue, not just on properties that have recently been sold. Okay, that's not a that's not a goal that a task force can accomplish. Well, but it's getting the implementation of this happening. And what can the task force accomplish? What is the task force going to accomplish? The task force, like uh, Councilman Burns said, um, the when you sell a property and you put a new sidewalk in, that doesn't do anything for the sidewalk that's dilapidated down the street. So that's kind of, that's one of the thoughts we had. It's like, well, that, that ordinance doesn't really fix anything. It's a start, but we need something more su substantial. Um, and that's why the task force, we thought we'd put a task force together so public works could have an input. But I mean, I, I agree, it's gotta be fast. We're not putting sidewalks in from here to March anyway. So um, I would, the plan is to have this all resolved and implemented by sidewalk time of, it, of be, being able to make it happen. Bree, do you have any input? I was just going to say, so we already have ordinances. 28-29 um, in the city code talks about the order to, con to construct and repair sidewalks. Um, if we have sidewalks that are not in good repair, bring them to the public works um, attention, and we can then issue orders to repair sidewalks. And even since I've been here, we've had a couple people come in on orders to repair. Um, so report those if you have sidewalks that need fixed. Um, additionally, 28-31 talks about the creation of a sidewalk district and the assessment of the cost. Um, so we do have that in our ordinance already if we wanna create a sidewalk district. There was a proposed ordinance, uh, legal department was asked to draft an ordinance that Ms. Welch talked about. Um, we saw a lot of questions that needed to be answered before bringing that forward. Um, and so I think that's why Councilwoman Welch wanted to create a task force to be able to get the citizens input and answer those questions that I know at least the legal department had before we presented that ordinance. Uh, but I just wanted to say we already have two things yeah. on the books. Yeah. So we have the tools to get the sidewalks fixed. They're just not being used. The task force, it sounds like you're trying to hone in and fix the problems with the ordinance? No, the, the task force, partially, the task force is to get sidewalks put into places where there are no sidewalks. In my particular ward, Bellevue Boulevard, there's a lot of houses that do not have sidewalks and there's some houses there's no way you could put a sidewalk in. My particular house, in my ward does not have a sidewalk. There are no sidewalks on, and I live one block away from an elementary school. There are no sidewalks on either side of the street. And the task force is to get sidewalks put into places where there are no sidewalks. To come up with a plan to do that. Correct. Okay. And that might be uh, whether we put the sidewalk districts in place, because uh, this council is gonna have to have the political appetite to to do that because sidewalk or uh, districts are not popular. So, yeah, I mean, because those are assessed back against the property, right? That's yeah, correct. And, yeah. And that is understandable. And so my understanding is though, is, is if you take a small portion and say city gets a bid, it might be more expensive than doing a, a big sidewalk improvement dif uh, district. So the bigger it is, the, my understanding is, is potentially the, the cheaper the project and but i think the actually no yeah that is, is that is not correct mr shannon because i talked to a gentleman who does concrete work and he says if he does it it's 10 bucks a square foot mm -hmm. you get a bigger company that puts in miles of sidewalks you can go down to four bucks a square foot that is oh. huge difference yeah so I, I just want to interject so so the thing is is it's not just about putting in sidewalks or we don't need sidewalks the thing is, is we do have the tools. I think we need to create the sidewalk improvement districts, and I think we need to start actually having bids and bringing them in front of the council and actually getting this this done. So, and, and that's where I'm at. So, so. Ms. Um, Mr. Burns, and I appreciate what you're saying, but as an example, one of the things I called legal was, are we gonna require sidewalks on both sides of the street? And then if we do, then we have some sides of the street can't put a sidewalk in. So now are you gonna overload permits and inspections and, and the council to create waivers? 
on each individual property that cannot do a sidewalk. So we already do that. But it's gonna overload the council if we decide to it, do that versus a task force that can come up with suggestions, ideas, recommendations, and get it implemented in a very easier way. So, but so <clears throat> to tell you the truth, um, instead of overloading the council, there may be some things that we can implement. For example, there is a hard uh, parking surface committee. So um, you sit on it, I sit on it, Councilman Pricer also sits on it. Um, you know, so for example, we have seen plenty of people um, who have to have um, parking lots paved, right? Um, and we might create a waiver due to financial burden, um, due to other issues that may arise. Um, <clears throat> and that actually doesn't come in front of the council um, as a committee with Tammy. We, we, we basically vote on that. Um, and I, I think that could easily work the same way. Now, I know a lot of this is all speculation, but I think there's a lot of easy solutions to some of that stuff. I just think that we need to start seeing action, and I just think it's something that we've talked about for a really long time. It's something that's been brought up, and I think it's just something that we got to start taking action on. Because if we don't start, when will we? I, you know, I think I think that's what we're doing is taking action. But Councilman Preister, thank you, Mayor. To conclude, I th I think it's a good discussion. I think uh, Councilman Shannon raised an appropriate issue, and that is the structure. This is incomplete. We need the parameters. We need the timelines. That's part of, I think, Council Policy 21, and it isn't complete. So I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt to vote on doing this and to approve it, but I want to see the parameters. I want to see that fleshed out and gotten to the Council and all this going on in an expeditious manner, which it sounds like we all want. So. I think we're on the same page. We're just figuring out how we get there. Thank you. One more comment. Okay. One of the other things we need to fix is we've had CDBG money available for sidewalk projects. And because of the way the city went about advertising those, we didn't get those in the hands of the contractors that would bid on them. So there's a lot of people out there that will bid these cement contract projects and they will come in at six fifty seven dollars you know, on small sidewalk projects like this and get them in where the big guys that would, if they were putting miles in, do these for five, they won't bid on these little jobs that we need done to get these sidewalks in. So we've got to go after different kinds of vendors and advertise differently to get to those people. And that's one of the things that you guys really need to figure out because the city ain't getting the bids in front of the people that would do the jobs. Well, and that's one of the opportunities I called Rich Severson today because somebody else, you know, from the legal department said, you know, there may be ADA money that's in the budget. And is if there is, then that's also money that could be used towards those sidewalks. So these are the things that we need to work through to find out and that's the part of the task force is to pull all of these parameters together so that we can all move in the same direction and it's getting the sidewalks. And my, my personal goal is to have this all done, rectified, figured out and done by the time spring comes around and we're laying concrete. And the other thing the task force would, I mean, can the city do any of this as well? So there's, there's a lot of discussion there that the task force I think can handle? Well, there's just a lot of questions and I think the task force is gonna be able to figure out what are these questions, what are the answers and what's the direction we go on this. And if uh, and if you do put in a, a sidewalk district, you've got the task force recommendations, which is gonna help, help with our decision making too, so. Councilman Burns. Yes, so um, uh, Councilwoman Welch, uh, could we get a specified date as to when? Um, I know you're saying springtime, and then could we also, um, <clears throat> who's going to sit on the task force? Sure. Um, and then would it just be uh, council members, or are you? Um, no, there's, there's, right now there's planned of three council members, um, Mr. Risto, um, and some department heads that apply mm -hmm. legal, um, and, you know, some other department heads, and I'll be happy to share that with all of you as to who that is and but part of it is 
I don't want to say Chief Clary's going to be on it when he's going to maybe assign it to somebody else. So, so it's a matter of having that first meeting, getting all of the input, bringing everyone up to speed, and then running it from that point. So uh, would it be fair to say, you know, if we do approve this, that citizens also have to be on it? Um, and that might be a citizen who is wheelchair bound, um, someone with a uh, disability, someone who is elderly, and, and maybe, you know, uh, someone who... I think we're already, we already have guidelines family. within the city as far as the ADA compliance and everything. So, I mean, I, 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 wouldn't, have, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But I have no problem with giving it... Um, the um, residents, the opportunity to talk, but I think we as a city need to have a plan first and a direction and then present it to the community and get their input before we implement anything that happens. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, so we have a motion by Cook, second by Burns. Uh, please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. Item Thank nine. you. Item nine, we uh, did not receive any uh, citizen communication request. Uh, no liquor licenses for 10. Uh, the amended agenda brings us to 16C. Which is uh, 16C, approve the renewal of city employee insurance plans and premiums for the respective term for qualified employees and retirees in an amount not to exceed $181,931.32. And we have our insurance gurus here, so. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. My name is Mike Williams, and with me is my associate, Jim Garbina. We're with the Harry A. Coke Company, and um, we have some really good news this year. Um, as you're aware, our plan year starts again in January 1. And uh, what we, we were able to do with the uh, carrier Blue Cross Blue Shield is to basically generate a two year rate guarantee. That hasn't, uh, October 15th was my 41st year in this industry. And I haven't been able to do this in a long time. So I'm kind of excited that we were able to get a two year rate guarantee. It, it really helps everybody from a budgetary standpoint. Uh, it's a negative 1% the first year and zero the second. The negative 1% is going to be used to put towards the partial self-fund, of which that's the plan we set up many years ago to help keep our costs in control, and it's working. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, Janie's done a great job with the wellness plan that we have in place. And, and when we first started this wellness plan, if you remember, it's kind of a crawl before you walk, walk before you run, not like a light switch, but it's working. And we're starting to see little by little uh, some of the positive things that happen with a good wellness plan. So for a group our size, public sector, to get uh, basically two years of zero is really, really good. And um, our employees love Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, and Blue Cross Blue Shield loves the city of Bellevue. So we were able to negotiate that, like I said, and um, uh, that helps us work with the different funding mechanisms over the next two years to, to, and there's no plan design change. It's the same plan design, which is good. We've had our meetings with <clears throat> our union representatives and they were extremely happy with uh, what's taking place. So any questions on the health insurance? And I know you all received some packet information too, I believe, before your council meeting. So, any questions on the health side? Yes, ma'am. Um, just a quick question. Um, so, the premiums for that the employee pays, did those, they no, stayed the same? They stayed the same, yes. That's even better. Yes. Yes, the employees like that. <laughs> And I would, uh, I, I did try to get it even lower, didn't I? Yes, you did, Mayor. And right. um, um, we're, for the record, we're working on it. <clears throat> but anyway, um, 
So now we'll, we'll talk about ancillary coverage, which is the life insurance, the long-term disability, the dental insurance. We call those ancillary coverages. We are currently with MetLife, and MetLife uh, kind of threw us some increases. And so since we were fortunate in negotiating um, a two-year rate guarantee on our health side, we went out to different carriers, and uh, we were able to negotiate some two and three year rate guarantees with ancillary coverages by moving it from Metropolitan Life to Reliance Standard. And we, the city, have been with Reliance Standard before. It's worked well. Um, the only reason we moved was because of a rate structure. But for example, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I apologize, this mask makes me look like Yoda because my ears <laughs> are so big. <laughs> But it's, it's hard to talk. But anyway, the dental, we got a 7.47% decrease with the guarantee rate for two years. The basic life in AD&D, no life change rates guaranteed for three years. Supplemental life, no change in costs guaranteed. Long-term disability, um, we got a negative 5.19% decrease, and that's guaranteed for three years. And then on the vision, no change, but they've changed the rate guarantee to three years. So this gives us the opportunity from a budgeting standpoint to know exactly what our costs are going to be for our employees for two and sometimes in three years. So again, um, our employees have done a great job, great job in getting involved in the wellness. We're still really pushing the wellness program because I think it does help. And as I said, Janie's done a great job in kind of keeping that going. So uh, open up to any questions. Any questions? Councilman Preister. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mike. Uh, you make a very good looking Yoda, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. And, Thank and you. I appreciate the Blue Cross Love Bellevue and that we have yeah. a love fest going. We need that these days. Yes. So, And I appreciate the negotiation with other insurance providers to get to this point. It's predictable for us as we work on contract negotiations, but also on budgets. And that's very important to us and the citizens. So keeping that in, in mind and knowing we're not going to have increases is very helpful. Yes. So I appreciate your efforts and, and your companies and associates, as well as our finance director in working with you. So Thank you very much. No, no question, just congratulations on a good job. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? All right. Thanks for your hard work, and thanks for our employees keeping things under control. You bet. Thank thanks you. again, everybody. Do you want a motion uh, to approve? Need yep. I'll make a motion. We approve item 16C. I'll second that. Motion by Shannon, seconded by Welch. Any com comments or questions? Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. Uh, again, on the amended agenda, that will take us to item 14B, request for approval of the South Roads, uh, South Woods Manager LLC redevelopment plan for lots 9 through 11, South Woods, applicant South Woods Manager LLC. General location is Nebraska Drive and Childs Road West. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the public hearing, but we'll, we'll agree. Yes. Can we do a joint public hearing since it's the same topic for 12B and 14B? They're both on the same plot. Let's, um, Tammy and I talked about this before and just kind of legally and progression wise, it we need to have them separate and we need to do 14B before. Um, and I guess I would just encourage you that if you have similar comments, you know, um, when you come up the second time, maybe just state that you have the similar comments, but they are two different items and they should be done separately. All right. You're okay. welcome. I'm gonna open up the public hearing. Uh, uh, we have the uh, representat representative of the applicant here. Um, so, be prepared to come up after he is done talking. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the 
Council Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant. What I would ask maybe if, you know, since they're kind of part and parcel to each other, I may want to describe a little bit about what is in the prior um, item on the agenda without duplicating things. I don't want to have to go through the whole thing again, but I think it's important. Under, if you understand the redevelopment plan, it might be under, it's, it's important, I think, to understand the rezoning request that's on the earlier part of the agenda. So I appreciate Mr. Shannon's uh, uh, question. So is that okay if we talk about both or do you want me to completely? Uh, I think it's okay for you to give that historical background of how they play into each other. Um, but the comments from the public on 14B should be regarding the redevelopment plan and then the other items on the next public hearing. Right. Okay, that's great. And and I can keep it as simple as I as you would like on this particular item and talking about just the things that re relate to the redevelopment plan itself and get into the more uh, aspects of the development itself on the other um, agenda item. Anyway, uh, again, I'm representing the applicant with me tonight is Kef Cassie Innes of uh, Apogee, who's uh, also working with the uh, redeveloper in this particular uh, project. The parcel is 4.52 acres and uh, it's currently undeveloped and I think this is the important part. It has been subdivided and undeveloped for over 50 years. So this property has been platted and zoned for over 50 years and nothing's happened to it. So that is what makes it, it ripe for redevelopment. Uh, it's also already been designated blighted and substandard by the City Council in 2000. 11, I believe in the history is then again, apparently in 2013 for whatever reason, but so it's, it's been platted undeveloped for over 50 years and it's currently designated blighted and substandard. So it's ripe for redevelopment. Um, the redevelopment plan is obviously consistent with the city's comprehensive uh, development plan. And even more than that, a step further, this property is actually zoned RG eight and it's also zoned RG eight planned uh, subdivision. What's on the item uh, earlier in the agenda that we'll get to after this matter is really to combine the three lots that currently exist into one lot. And then also, if you're going to take those three lots, combine them into one lot, you need a consistent, consistent zoning classification, which is the RG8 plan subdivision, which is, you know, a step of uh, a more as far as just the RG8 zoning, because it's, it's under a planned subdivision, the site plan has to be approved and everything else by the department. So again, this comes to you with favorable recommendations from uh, your planning department, as well as uh, I believe it was unanimous uh, recommendation of approval from the planning commission as well last month. Uh, it is a 107 unit multifamily housing project. Again, already zoned for this type of use. So there's nothing new there. Uh, the expected valuation on full build out is $15.5 million. And uh, the TIF eligible expenses, uh, which are in the, your packet, are $1,853,782. Those TIF eligible expenses are comprised of acquisition costs, public improvement costs, and site preparation costs that will be incurred as part of this uh, redevelopment. Um, the request of uh, the TIF is in the principal amount of $1,853,782, which matches the TIF eligible expenses, right? Because that's the idea is that um, the TIF request is to repay the developer for those TIF eligible expenses that are being expended to make this project happen. Um, we believe it meets all the requirements of the community development laws. And uh, in the application, you'll note that the, there's a pro forma. And in that pro forma, they showed that with TIF, the return on the investment is 9.3%. Without the TIF, uh, the return is 1.5%. So obviously um, a developer wouldn't move forward on a project with the high costs associated with it with for a 1.5% return on their investment. Uh, also important to note that the current amount of tax revenue that comes in from this undeveloped lot for the last 50 years, uh, today's uh, taxes that come in on an annual basis are $11,341. Um, of the, the real estate taxes that are expected to come in on full stabilization of the 107 units being leased is $192,600. So if you believe in the but for test, but for TIF, you wouldn't do this deal, which in this particular case, based upon the return on investment, they wouldn't do it. Um, the city and all the other various taxing authorities 
instead of just getting $11,341, which you continue to get for the full 15 years because the, the base valuation, there's no shift in revenue between uh, today or after uh, the redevelopment plan and redevelopment agreements in place. So there's no shifting of that $11,341. But what, what happens is at the end of the uh, life of the TIF, which is 15 years um, from the redevelopment agreement, the city and the other various taxing authorities will get substantially more revenue, which is $192,600. And that's in today's dollars. Obviously, you know, one thing that never goes down is valuations typically and uh, tax uh, levies typically. So, you know, ultimately you'll get more revenue um, in the future based upon this project. And I think that's the whole premise, it is the whole premise of the community development law in the state of Nebraska is that but for TIF, the project wouldn't occur. So with that, I, I do have um, site plans and elevations, which we can get into the rezoning aspects of it if you'd like, if you wanna know more about the, the zoning uh, and the project itself as part of this presentation, I'm happy to go into that. Uh, if not, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have also. Any questions? Councilman Cook? Uh, Mayor, I, I would like to see some of the development, what you're just talking about, what it looks, uh, your plans. I went up to the site and it sits high. And some of the homes that are to the west of it, you know, from the south end, you can see pretty much of the home, but by the time you get to the north end, you see a roof of a home. And I'm just sort of curious of what is, what the site looks like developed out being three-story apartment buildings and how it would sit on the lot. There's a, a major power line that goes through the lot. So what I'm doing right now, hopefully, is putting up the site plan so you can see. Um, Let's take a minute to warm up. So the site is difficult. It's very irregular in shape. Uh, that's probably why it hasn't developed. It is has some uh, odd topography as well. Um, it drops significantly as you go to the north, uh, and that's where the detention basin is. Um, but every effort has been made, as you'll see with the uh, site plan, that um, we're trying to minimize the impacts to the adjacent residential neighborhood. Councilman Shannon. How many stories are these going to be? There are three stories, but there's only three buildings and there's only one that's actually, you'll, as you'll see here, um, what's the best way to do that? No, that's fine. You'll, you'll note that the south is where the two buildings are. Um, the north is where the parking lot I is. So um, north is to your left, uh, south is to your right, and west is to your left and East is to your right. I'm, well, geez, how are we doing that? Uh, <laughs> you want to come point? Yeah, I can do that. I'll have a east, east is up. Uh, north is up. Oh, okay. North is up. North this, is the one. This is east along Nebraska Drive. This is south <laughs> along Childs. And this is west along the adjacent residential neighborhood. So you know if there's three three-story buildings here, uh, there's 36 units in each of these. There's 35 units in this one with the, uh, the leasing office in this particular building. So efforts were made to keep the buildings more towards Nebraska Drive as opposed to next to the adjacent residential neighborhood. And then I can come back over here. Um, you'll note that the uh, buffer yard on the western part of the property where the building is is 30 feet and that's meet your site regulators for this particular zoning classification. As you head north um, and you get more towards the parking lot where the, the uh, power lines are, and I can point those out to you real quick also. So this is the uh, power lines that run through the site. This is the detention basin, surface parking. These are detached garages, and of course these are the buildings. Access points are here and here on Childs. So there's no access that goes through the adjacent residential neighborhood. So when you get further to the north, um, it actually, it, the buffer is about 60 feet at its largest point and then about 39 feet 
uh, as it narrows to the, the very far north. But uh, you can see there's a substantial amount of landscaping and buffering between this proposed project and the adjacent residential neighborhood. And we're happy to talk about more landscaping if necessary. Um, there was talk at the Planning Commission about, you know, maybe a fence. We don't think a fence is as attractive as berming and landscaping. I think it looks, you know, a lot nicer. Um, so there's no accesses, access points going through the neighborhood. Everything's either on Nebraska Ave uh, or uh, Child's Road. Um, let's, so let's get back to the basic math of the situation, sure. though. Okay, so you're talking about 36 multifamily units. 107. 107 total. total, 36 per building. It, well, and then 35 in the one so building. So you're talking about 100, packing 180 people into each of the three buildings. But I would point out to you that the zoning that's RG8 uh, actually. I'm, 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 I'm worried about reality, not zoning. I, I know you're good on the zoning to, to do this, but I'm just saying, is it smart to do this? Where, I mean, what size are these apartments going to be? Uh, well, there the tenant mix is um, there are 64 efficiency one bedrooms. There's 35 two bedrooms and there's eight three bedrooms. The average rental rate is 1,100 a month, so they're not inexpensive. It's a market rate project. There's this is a low income housing project. It's not an affordable deal. This is conventional financing, and the average rental rate is 1,100 dollars a month. So it, I would call it with respect to the building materials and such. It's a class A project, but probably more like a B plus. And the reason yeah. why though, is that there's not a pool um, as far as an amenity, but there is a clubhouse. And in that clubhouse is a fitness center and uh, lockers and a courtyard with grills outside, that kind of thing. But there is not a swimming pool. So it's probably a B plus because of that fact alone. Otherwise, with respect to the amenities and the and the elevations and the building materials and such, I would, I would, it would be a class A, but for the fact that it doesn't have a more significant clubhouse with a swimming pool, for example. All right. And how many of the parking spots are between the two buildings? There are a total of 137 ground parking surface spots. parking stalls. Right. Correct. How many of those are in between the two buildings? In between the two buildings? Uh, I don't have, I didn't do the count on that. Because everything else is way off to the north. Right. And then you have uh, 50 detached garage parking, and those are noted by those narrow uh, buildings. Is that included in the 137, the 50? No, no, no. 137 is just surface parking. So you're looking at 187 parking spots total. Uh, well, you've got 50 garages and There's 187 between the parking garages and the surface parking. But then also there's on-street parking, which is 22 parking stalls that are allowed on Nebraska Drive. And that apparently was always contemplated because Nebraska Drive is 44 feet in width. So it's almost a uh, four lane street at that point. So it, it satisfies um, the ability to have on-street parking for at least 22 stalls. So <coughs> the parking ratio is 1.95 uh, parking stalls per unit. So it's, I think your your code is two um, parking stalls per unit, but that's such a small discrepancy between that and with the plan subdivision, that's how you can uh, justify the 1.95 versus the two. But it's that's a small discrepancy in the big scheme of things. I think this is relatively low density considering the fact that you're based on the acres, you could actually have 215 units here. So it's 108 units less than what you could have under your zoning classification. So I don't think anyone's overbuilding this site by any stretch. Do you have a entrance that's gonna be going out onto Nebraska Drive, you said? Or? Uh, no, I'm, well, yes, on the north side, I believe. It's hard to see. Is that here? So, and then so you have one access here on the child and one access here on the Nebraska Drive. So with the amount of cars that you're going to have in there at any one time, 107 units, you probably figure there's going to be somewhere close to 200 cars. You're going to have, we've got a new elementary school being built right across the right. street from that. You're going to 
be dumping extra traffic out onto Nebraska Drive uh, right past an elementary school that's right there. Right, but what, you, but what you find with multifamily housing is that it's not like an office building where you, you don't have these high AM and PM peak trips in a multifamily housing project. Not everyone's leaving at between you know six and eight in the morning and coming home at four and five. They're leaving at all different times of the day. So the disbursement uh, and use of Nebraska Drive isn't what you would think it would be because not everyone's leaving at once. Not everyone's coming home at once. They're coming out over the entire uh, day. I had also pointed out, I've got this aerial photograph and I don't know if it goes far enough. Maybe I have one that does. This kind of shows there isn't a lot of traffic on Nebraska Drive anyway for its size. I mean, the, the right-of-way width and the paving width. I'll show you this. If the, so this, this connects Chandler to Childs and there isn't a whole lot that really utilizes um, Nebraska Drive. And so this, the, the Nebraska Drive, we believe in, a, and, and Reagan Pence is here from Lambert the consulting engineers on this particular project. Nebraska Drive can easily handle the amount of traffic contemplated by this development. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of traffic that comes on Nebraska Drive. I patrolled that area for several years on the police department, and that's a very busy stretch of road between Childs and Chandler because they use it as a cut through to avoid if they see a train coming, they'll cut through there to avoid the trains, and uh, they do it to take shortcuts through there. So it but, gets a lot of traffic right. through there. But what I would tell you about the zoning, about your comp plan, and about the construction of Nebraska Drive is that they contemplated 215 units being able to be here. Again, it's already zoned RG8. So this isn't a stretch at all. This is actually a reduction of the total number of units that could be constructed here. And, and it actually becomes you know, a, a nice development for this particular area, especially uh, a lot that hasn't been developed in 50 years. I mean, that seems to suggest that it needs some shot in the arm here uh, to make this deal work. And that's, I guess, why this developer is requesting the TIF because the returns what? aren't great. What Without discussions it. have taken place for stoplights in this area? I don't know that a traffic signal would be warranted. Um, I'll, I'll that, let's turn that it one over to it Reagan. Would, it would seem like possibly at Nebraska and Childs would be an, a good option with the traffic we're adding there. Uh, Reagan Pence, Lamp Ray Nearson. And uh, yeah, we're the uh, consulting engineers. And we also did the, uh, the traffic study for the school across the street. And in reviewing that traffic study and the infrastructure, the road widths, um, we determined, uh, and then to Larry's point, that the, uh, the, the hours are dispersed when people are leaving and coming home from the multifamily projects, that this project, the infrastructure is built out for you know, a much higher use. And we did work with the, uh, the city public works department for the Columbus and Nebraska intersection there by adding some bump outs and pedestrian uh, crossings there, and we will continue to coordinate with them um, for what that looks like. Councilman Pricer. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that a developer wants to develop in the area. I want the developer to win. I also want the neighbors to win. So hopefully we'll hear from some of the neighbors of some of the concerns and some discussions and negotiations can take place. One of the concerns I have is parking. It looks like the parking goes all the way to the north. It does include the area under the power lines, correct? It's got to be maintained as right away, but that, that's correct. And, and, and parking something that's permitted under an OPPD easement like this. I mean, that's about all that's actually permitted because structures are not. So you have to use that property in some way that's actually uh, usable okay. because of the easement. Sure. So is there an option of having a little less right-of-way or buffer down on the very far north 
so that some additional parking spaces could be put there. I'm, I'm not liking the idea of having parking on Nebraska Avenue. With school buses, with the increased traffic, with the curbs, with the buffer and the landscaping along the street, I like some of that, but I'm, I'm seeing a hazard. As kids are in the school, we're bound to have kids crossing through there. There are cars parked out there on Nebraska Ave. It seems very risky to me. So if there's a way to do a little reconfiguring and put a few more parking places, I think you were only short of, I think it said that there were 200 and, where is it? 214 that were required and you had 209 on site. So it's not a big difference. Bill, that's counting 22 on the road. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's counting the 22 on the road. But I guess what I would say about that is I believe in talking with the Public Works Department and your planning department is that was always contemplated as far as on-street parking because each one of those lanes that you see there are, are like I said, the right-of-way width is 44 feet. Well, for four lanes, if you had four complete drive lanes, it would be 50 feet. So there's plenty of room for that parking along this one side of Nebraska Drive um, because of the paving width that's there. It, it is wide, but that was contemplated before school was ever there and before traffic was coming in from the east. So I, that's kind of something for the planning department, but I'm, I'm suggesting that. I'm also suggesting the buffer. The trees are not going to be very big or do much buffering between the three-story apartments and the property owners for several years. So the idea of a buffer fence will help mitigate some of the encroachment So obviously we have to comply with your zoning code with respect to the trees that are planted. And my understanding it's two and a half inches in caliper and they're uh, eight to 14 feet in height or 12 to 14, 12 to 14 feet in height. So they're not in insignificant trees from day one. And we're happy to work with the, the neighborhood um, to the West and, and see what kind of trees they want. I mean, do they want deciduous? Do they want conifers? What do they want? As long as we meet your code, we have no problem with working with them on that. Sure. Once they're planted, though, all of the coniferous trees are under attack from bagworms and a host of other disease. So we're losing them rapidly. I unfortunately don't have a whole lot of faith for how long those trees are going to be around with us. But once the trees are planted, what's the obligation or the responsibility for replacing them should they be impacted and no longer be there? The fence um, is going to stay there. We, I, you know, I don't know. I, I can talk to the developer, but I don't know why we wouldn't agree to some kind of a buffer plan that says if they become dead or dying, we'll re re replace them. That's not, I don't think that's. <clears throat> Looks like Tammy might have a thought. I can answer that. Oh. <laughs> so upon uh, approval of a certificate of occupancy, we request every commercial developer that's required to do landscaping or multifamily residential developer that's required to do landscaping, they must sign a landscape maintenance agreement, which states if any of those required shrubs or trees die, they must be replanted. Um, so that is a document that we keep on file with the planning department. It's a way to go back. Um, and if those materials die, they would have to be replanted by the developer. Is there a time limit on that, Tammy? Right. Basically, um, that is good in perpetuity. I mean, it's, it's always that way. Um, so if I go tell somebody, hey, all your coniferous trees died, you have to replant them, they would have to replant them. So that, that stays, there's no expiration date on that. Um, it runs with the development. Wow. Okay. Thank you. One more question. Sure. How many loading and unloading uh, parking spots are there in between for each of the buildings? Because of the parking situation, I'm thinking of people coming in with groceries or, you know, coming home from the store with, you know, boxes and things that need to be carried in. I mean, uh, everybody's not going to get to park in the front there, you know, and 
So it, it would seem like there's going to be a need in something this tight with uh, that many people, you know, 36 families in, in each building to have a loading spot in front of each building or two. Uh, yeah, but I guess what I would say about that is remember if the, the tenant mix itself, um, 64 of them, there are one bedrooms and efficiencies. So probably not going to have families in, in at least 64 of them, you know, two bedrooms, you know, maybe you have. So they don't more. go to the grocery store and eat? Well, sure, they do that. But that's part of multifamily living, right? I mean, I, I think that's what everyone understands when you um, live in a, an apartment complex is that may, you may not have the best direct access all the time to your particular building or unit, but but you have the opportunity to lease a detached parking garage that guarantees you at least a place to, to park. Um, I don't know if there's any discussion about um, having particular unloading and loading zones, you know, um, at all. I don't know that I've ever seen that in any of the multifamily projects that I've worked on. I guess I'm thinking about the person carrying the groceries in, sorry. Councilman Cook. Thank you. Larry, just a couple quick things. I, sure. I'm struggling with the parking too. Um, I honestly believe, you know, if we're going to somewhat rely on 22 spots on Nebraska Avenue, what happens when visitors and parties and celebrations and gatherings are occurring? And I, well, what part of my fear is what you're going to do is with these apartments along Nebraska Avenue, you're almost going to force people to say, I might as well park on Nebraska Avenue, cross the sidewalk, a little green space, and I'm on my, you know, my porch. So why would I swing and go way north and park at the, uh, at the full north side of this lot? I, well, I, I can't believe, well, I, I should say this, but if we would allow 215 units in there, they'd have to be six, seven stories high to, to allow and find parking for them, you know what I mean? Right, there in might that, have to be an underground four parking and a garage. half a, acre. Right. So it just when you say 215 units could be there, I'm sitting there saying adding another 108 and parking, you'd have to go f probably six stories high and have a multi-level parking lot. Right, but that's just, not what's being proposed here. I, mean, I was just merely saying I, that's what your zoning would allow. I think allow. we're just forcing people to park on North Nebraska Avenue and I'm telling you, I'm like uh, Mr. Stenson here, was a police officer for many years, and I will tell you, around schools, at the beginning and the end of schools, is nothing but a nightmare. I would have to say that it was probably one of the biggest issues that we addressed as a police officer with traffic. I think the school, and maybe someone that lives in the neighborhood will clarify this, and maybe you can, I think they were gonna do the buses on the Nebraska side and maybe the pickup on the other side, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, but for me, it's going to be a school across the street, and I don't know how big it's going to be. Uh, my kids went to an elementary school that had over 400 kids in it, and I can tell you there were dozens and dozens of parents picking up their kids and in this particular case with Fort Crook and kids getting across Fort Crook, I would think they maybe would have a higher percentage of parents picking kids up. I, it just seems like a lot of development in an area. I, I, I'm gonna have, I, I could see at the north end of that lot, people parking trailers or camper or whatever and they just leaving it there, their fishing boat or whatever and then parking on Nebraska Avenue and I don't think parking on Nebraska Avenue should be considered that's where we have to park versus, hey, if you invite friends over, tell them to park on Nebraska Avenue for f four hours while we're having a set watching the football game. So one thing, okay. the, the owner will not allow boats or campers or anything else to be parked in the parking lot. That won't be allowed at all. But, but maybe this will help you as far as showing you where those uh, 22 parking stalls are on Nebraska Ave and then also showing you where the bump outs are because there actually will be bump outs that you can pull in. And so it, it, it's not just on the street. So let me show you that. Thank you. So if you see this little point here, that little bump out, so they start from here and the stalls go all the way back. Oops. 
back to uh, there's some up here I think as well right so this is where the stalls are they're not they're not down in this area well they won't be because of the median I would right. imagine but so they're all up in this area up here and and here's where the bump outs are uh, to kind of protect the on street parking so so you're going to create bump outs on our on our, that street yes and there's and there's room for that and and maybe Tammy can add to that as well, but that was always contemplated with Nebraska Avenue because of its street width and the type of street that it is. So it, it, it's not out of the ordinary and it's not something that is unsafe. In fact, it is, it's very safe based upon the paving widths. I, I, I'm not gonna disagree with you, but I, I think you see it more in a, say a downtown Bellevue area where you know, you're gonna park on the street, downtown Omaha, you're gonna park on the street where this is the residential. I don't know if you really see it real big in residential. I mean, I could be actually, wrong. Actually, yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, in Omaha right now, in a lot of the um, mixed use areas, which have multifamily housing, in addition to single family housing and commercial, all along the main street, uh, main drags, there's on street parking all over the place. In fact, I'm doing a, a major development right now called North Streams on 204th and Q. And that whole development has a lot of on-street parking on, on both sides of the street. Um, and, and there's a lot of other developments in Omaha that, um, not, not that you're Omaha, but, but there are a lot of developments actually that allow for the on-street parking. But is it a mixture of commercial and then maybe apartments or townhomes on top of the commercial, say a three-level building where maybe the main floor is a commercial the upper floors are for living and yes then they will that's what happens down in the old no, market the, but these these are not that okay. these are these are just like this i'm doing another deal called the grove the grove at 192nd leavenworth they have uh, on-street parking for the multifamily that goes right through it uh the project so okay. you actually see it more than you think i'm okay. thank you thank you councilwoman welch um larry with regards to this um parking issue um, is it reasonable, and it may not be reasonable, to put a request that they can't park there any more than three days or 24 hours or any, anything like that? I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to alleviate. So uh, two things, <laughs> um, we, we could restrict the parking on Nebraska Ave for specific hours, um, maybe not during school hours, um, if that was a, a concern. Uh, number two, I think with the PS on the zoning, the plan subdivision, you could actually eliminate the parking stalls on Nebraska Ave if you wanted to. Now, it, it changes the parking ratio, but that's something you could do. And in talking with the, the developer just now, that would be fine if, if that's the pleasure of the council. So I personally don't see it as an issue. I don't think, you know, the planning department does or the planning commission didn't. But if, if the council thinks that that's an issue or we want to restrict them to not 22, maybe something less than that, if you want to restrict them to no parking during school hours, I mean, we're open to that kind of thing. I think there'll be, once we hear, I'm assuming there'll be some public here speaking either on this item or on uh, the next yeah, one. Yeah, I so, mean, this is the redevelopment plan, yeah. but but I know we were gonna get in right. to a lot of this other stuff because they are part and parcel to each other. You can't really talk about one without the other. Any other questions right now? We'll let you take a, oh, Councilman Preister. Thank you, Mayor. Just not so much for Larry, but public works or somebody I would like to hear about any plans for Child's Road and uh, Nebraska Avenue is gonna dump out there. We're gonna have the school. We're gonna, it's an asphalt road. It's not in the greatest of shape and we're gonna increase traffic. I don't need it now. We can have the public hearing, but at some point I'd like to hear what the future plans are for that stretch of, of road that's gonna. 
right now we don't know what the school traffic is going to be, but our experience, all of us know at schools, is pretty heavy. So I want to make sure the city's portion of this too is being considered well and well, just what those plans are. Thank and you. It, and it sounds like we can control uh, with parking hours for schools as school hours as well. So if I would point out that a traffic study was done for this area um, when the school came in. It was updated by Lamp Rynearson before this project came forward. We made that request to staff so that we could see those numbers because, you know, we do know with the school there, it is going to be a different mix. Um, as Mr. Jobin stated, the, the right-of-way width is large enough in that area to handle the parking. Um, our public works engineers have reviewed that with the developer. They are okay with this configuration. Um, they have reviewed it from an engineering standpoint. Um, perhaps Mr. Dunn can come over after the public hearing or, you know, um, as we move forward and talk about any plans for Child's Road. I'm not aware of what the shorter long-term plans would be for improving Child's Road, if anything, um, but the parking has been looked at by our engineering team. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to let you guys, well, you got something else, Larry? Sorry, uh, I, I actually was not aware of this, but, um, and you can see this a little bit here on this site plan drawing, but apparently um, as you go uh, north of Columbus Avenue, there's currently on-street parking on Nebraska Drive, so not controlled by us at all, but and you can kind of see it. So we don't have an aerial photograph that goes completely north, but you see, notice that car there. Uh, so what Mr. Pence told me, uh, Lamp Pearson, he said that there's currently on-street parking all along uh, Nebraska Avenue, which would be the same width that we're talking about, you know, in, in front of, along the frontage of this particular project. I didn't even know that. So um, that just some information I thought you might need to know. I agree with that. I drove it. I, my, I guess my concern is I'm sort of getting the feeling here we're going to rely on that. We know residents are going to have to park there. Now, I know that happens in every neighborhood mm -hmm. and everywhere around here, but I'm just concerned. I'm concerned that, well, we probably should get to the public hearing, but I'm concerned that with the parking so far north, I think it's only going to encourage people to gravitate to the road. And I would like that only to be used if everything else is full by residents. And that place maybe be used by a mom that wants to park and go into school or come into the apartment complex and visit a friend. Right. Well, I mean, I kind of like the idea if if the council is willing to go along with that is just restrict the parking uh, to those hours that are not school hours, uh, maybe on weekends and then after five and have to be out, you know, before six or something like that. I don't think that is an issue. And then, you know, obviously it becomes enforcement, but it didn't take long to uh, enforce it and figure out that you better not park there in those off hours, right? Um, so anyway, that's all I have. Happy to answer any more questions though. Thank you. Okay, well, public hearing is open, so we'll let you take a break and uh, just hang around. And if there's anybody in the audience uh, or do we have a count? Is there many people in the other room so I can get an idea? Yeah, and this, this is discussion on 14B, which is the redevelopment plan for lots 9 through 11. Okay, thank you. Um, so public hearing is open for the redevelopment plan, item 14B. So if there's anyone here wanting to speak regarding that, please come forward. I, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused since there's two and I wasn't really sure where I should speak or where I actually fit. So um, my name is Deborah Duff. I live at 1107 Denver Street in Bellevue, and I am the owner of Lot 13. Um, um, I provided a letter to the city council members, and then I, we also sent it to Susan. Um, we, I have been to, we did receive that okay. and uh, we'll put that in the record as well I have been to um, a zoom meeting and heard um, 
heard, uh, was listening to everything for the Zoom meeting, and I went to the Planning Commission meeting, um, not realizing that the Planning Commission was just for zoning. Um, so I, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot recently reading on berms. I've learned a lot recently leading, um, reading on blighted and substandard in Bellevue in the state of Nebraska. Um, I'm trying to be a very um, informed, concerned citizen. I'm trying to bring forward concerns having lived in a house, you know, having lived here for, in my home for 41 years. Um, my lot does bump up against the transmission, the lines. And I know that anything I put in the right of way, be it a tree, be it a shrub, be it a fence, if anything happens with the power lines, I am responsible to replace whatever they may have to remove. I have a concern regarding my yard. Um, so Deborah, are you this house here? Because if, if this is the power lines, isn't I it? am over. This one? The other way. You're this one. That's the, I am that one. Okay, yes, Thank I'm you. not on the, I am on Denver Street on the curve. I do not border Columbus. Okay. I am on Denver Perfect. Street. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I know, I, I guess I, one of my concerns is, what's gonna happen, A, you're gonna have, I'm sorry, you're gonna have kids, kids are kids, they are not all gonna walk over where they're supposed to walk over to cross the crosswalk. You're gonna have people going through, you're gonna have kids going through the apartment complex to get home back into the neighborhood, those that can walk. So is my yard going to become a thoroughfare for people going through? Because A, I don't have a fence there right now. Um, in the images you can see, I called um, Digger's Hotline 811. I had them come out and mark all of the power lines that are on just the hill section of the area. There is a junction box for Cox Cable for another communication and electric right, almost right on the property line between lots 12 and 13. So there's a lot of wires there. There's, you know, how do I put trees? How, excuse me, how do I put some type of a border um, to, there's, there's gonna be a lot of noise, I, you know, if there's gonna be parking there. If people have to walk 300 feet to get from the parking to that building, there's a lot of noise. Um, I, you know, I mean, there's gonna be, according to what being, listening and having where it's not going to be normal time frames that people are gonna be coming and going, it's gonna be odd time frames. So what does that mean for me? Does that mean that there's gonna be a lot of noise late in the evening or you know, late at night? Does it mean there's gonna be a lot of noise early in the morning with people coming and going? You know, I, I have a concern with that type of stuff. I, I you know, there are trees that line the, the property where you have people who have trees in their yards, but there also appears to be a whole row of trees and these are fairly, they're old, they're developed trees that are on kind of the borderline of where the development would be. And I think it's even on the borderline of where, if you can see where they have all the shrubs and the trees, there's some really big already developed trees there. Are those trees gonna have to come down, you know, to make room for the, for the buildings and the new things? Are, are we gonna lose all those old established trees that are up in, the neighborhood, even though it actually is right on the other side of somebody's property. And I'm not talking about the big ones that are in the middle of the, you know, that are in the middle of the land. I'm talking about the ones that actually border people's homes in the back. Those are big old trees. Um, I don't know if they're in good shape or bad shape, but I know we lost an awful lot of trees when the school went in the back. And then we had, you know, there was an awful lot of little animal um, activity around in the neighborhood. Um, the, the, I, I am confused. I'm trying to wrap my head around a berm and the way that the hill slopes down as it is, how are they, you know, how, do, how does a berm work? Um, is a berm going to prevent, is a berm going to prevent, you're, you're taking away a whole, a huge amount of green space that when it rains, when it snows, it gets absorbed into the land. I have seen it, I have lived there long enough, I have seen when we have had heavy rainstorms that some of the rain does come down into our backyards. And there's a hill, excuse me. 
Uh, there's missed, a missed stuff. I, the buzzer's on the five minute timer. I didn't right, give that warning, sorry. but um, tr we're gonna try to keep everybody close to five minutes as we can, knowing there's another public hearing tonight on, on a similar subject. So you can probably come back up and talk what you missed the first time. And then we're gonna try to answer these as many questions as we can when the public's done. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm so, just really, yeah. I'm very nervous. I had my no, that's fine. So I didn't look. I didn't just, mean to scare you with the buzzer. Nope, that's fine. <laughs> it was automatic. <laughs> Okay, anyone else uh, wanting to talk? Please come forward, state your name and your address, please. Scott Corview, 2711 Columbus Avenue. I'm lot 12 next to, I'm where the 40 parking lots are gonna be in my backyard to the west of me, or I'm sorry, to the east. So Scott, you are this correct. house here? Yeah. Yep, correct. Okay, right on the corner. Yes. Thank you. Um, I did an overlay with the school back at the planning board, if we could bring that up. I have, a, I have a plot showing the school and this. Can you bring that up from the planning board meeting? Is that possible? I don't think, I don't think that's in our packet. I think that's part of the Tammy's looking for it. I know Larry talked about density and, and Cook also brought it up. They could have 214 units somewhere around there. They don't have parking for the 107 they have now. So I know he keeps talking about 214 you know, the density of it. There's no way they could do the parking for what they have now. So even going larger would be inconsiderate. The tree aspect, I've lost three trees in the last three years due to worms, infestations. So uh, I know they have to replant the trees after they die, they're gonna, they're gonna end up dying. Um, I have a question on the water basin that's gonna be next to my property line. Um, the landscape architect, said in the Zoom meeting it'll 24 hours to drain? Correct. 24 hours to drain. So what, what happens to the oil that comes from the parking lot that goes down into that? The basin. In the basin. So if there's car oil, grease oil from the parking lot, is that into the ground? Or is there a grease trap? Or? No, it, it goes into the empty basin with uh, in, in the special soil mix. And that's supposed to help filter the uh, bulk of water. Okay. Um, I had a design question. It says 60% of the materials for class one is brick and glass. According to the ordinance, zoning ordinance, uh, they need three materials of class one. I don't know if that'll be discussed now or prior or during building permits. Tammy's over here, so probably building permits. I think we're thinking about Actually, that's part of building review committee, right? We're uh, yeah, just lay out your questions since we have you know okay, limited sorry. time, and then we'll try to answer all those at the end here. So, well, if if they could bring up the, you know, I kind of have issues with. So I did an overlay back for a planning committee. This shows where the exit of the school buses will be leaving and coming into. So roughly, can you just see my computer? Yeah, I can't. I can't point to it. That's okay. That's okay. I, I have a red note there. It states where the buses will be pulling out. If there's cars parked there. Are you talking right there? Yes, correct. Uh, down below that, a little for, Yeah, right there. That's where the buses will be exiting, out onto Nebraska Drive. So if there's cars parked there and the bus has to make a left hand turn, I don't know if they're going to run into the vehicles. Uh, if they make a right hand turn, they're going to run into the vehicles. Is students have to walk all the way down to the end of Nebraska Ave to the corner down there to do a crossing. That's that's a long way for them to walk. They're going to cut across. Um, it just 
the, he, he talked about the trees and that would look better than a fence. Well, the fence is for security for us. Um, I, I, a fence would be fine for me and security for our property and for Debbie's properties who doesn't have a fence. So we'd like to recommend that they need to install a six foot fence along the west perimeter of, of the buildings. Six to eight foot. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. I'll, I'll leave it open for my wife to come up to speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for listening to our concerns. Sure. <clears throat> I apologize in advance. I'm very nervous, public speaker. Um, we all are. All right. Um, okay. First, I'll address a couple of things that he talked about. Can you state your name and yes. address first, Sorry. please? Amy yep. Corview, okay. 2711 Columbus Avenue. And I know you guys probably got my letter. <laughs> and it is in the record, yep. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the things that he had just talked about was no parking during school hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a great idea, but like he stated, people that live in apartments don't work normal hours. So you're gonna have people that don't get up to go to work at 6 a.m., according to him, go to work at seven, are gonna have to go outside and move their car. What happens if there's not a parking spot for them to move their car to because there's no parking? Um, my other concern is with the parking. Um, I can say that being on lot 12, and seeing Nebraska Drive from our back patio. An example would be last year during winter, we had two cars that were abandoned on Nebraska Drive and were there for weeks, weeks, because they had a flat tire. Um, you know, it's just not a pretty, just not gonna be a pretty picture and I'm not trying to be selfish for me, but when I go stand out on my patio, I really don't want to see 22 cars along Nebraska Drive and a parking lot next to me. Um, I would also like to say uh, something what he brought up earlier. Down the road on Nebraska Drive, there is another apartment complex called Chandler Point. Um, they have over, so I did a little bit of research. They have 200 units and they have over 400 parking spots. And even with those 400 parking spots, there are multiple, multiple people that park on both sides of the road that live there. And just like one of these other gentlemen brought up, um, they park as close as they can to their apartment. So instead of parking in the parking lot, they park up the street, so they just walk across the grass. Um, okay. Some other things I want to address. Uh, can we bring up the other the other map that he had? Yes. Okay. Um, so an issue right here, if people aren't going to be able to park here and here because there's not going to be any parking spots, you're going to have people that the only other option is to be parking along this street right here and in front of these houses, um, which also is dangerous because if you have people parking here, this street's not going to be big enough. You're going to have people driving down Nebraska Drive, not being able to see because there's a car parked right here. And they're gonna turn, smash right into that person. Also right up here, where they wanna put an entrance, is right at the crest of a hill. Now I don't know if you dr drove that today when you drove around that area, but it's already, you know, it's a bad situation. You're pulling out here to try to take a left or a right, and you're already risking your life because people come up and over and you can't see them until they get to about right this point. 
So you're going to ask all these tenants, and I'm speaking for the tenants now, not me selfishly or personally, all these tenants that are going to be living there someday, you're going to ask them to risk their life pulling out of this spot every day because that's what they're going to be doing. And then also you're going to have people that are going to come down this road to turn into their apartment. And this person coming up behind them isn't going to see them while they've got their turning lane on right here, and they're going to get rear-ended. Um, I'm just trying to save lives and also save car accidents and save pedestrians being hit as well because you're going to have kids that are going to be walking around here as, um, after school and to school. And let's see, what else do I want to say about that? Okay. Well, you know, that's my time. <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you. Can I have a chair? Yep, go ahead. Amy, Amy, yes. would you come back up to the yes. podium? Show us on there where you were talking in your uh, email about where you would suggest stop signs. Oh, okay. Um, there definitely should be a three-way stop sign right here. So, or a stoplight. Okay. Um, also, up here is where I suggested the turning lane just to stop accidents from happening right in that area. Okay. But I think with the stop sign right here, you'd be forcing people, because even though the speed limit is fairly you know, slow right here, 25, you've got people that come around this curve down here that are not doing the speed limit. It's gonna force everybody to stop and actually look around and give this person time to see a car before they turn left or right. Yeah, because we do have to worry about dyslexic drivers that switch numbers around. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, public hearing still open. Is there anyone else here to speak to 14B? Please come forward, state your name and address. Hi, um, my name is Carmen Gunn. I live at 1105 Denver Street. Um, on here, I guess I would be lot number 14. Um, so thank you to my neighbors for coming up and expressing their concerns because I do have a lot of similar concerns. Some of the other ones that I have that haven't been mentioned though are um, the lack of barrier between our houses, um, my neighbor's houses and the apartment complex itself. It's great that there's gonna be shrubbery, but if anybody has ever visited an apartment complex that has been in or close to a neighborhood, they know that not everybody abides by the rules. Um, one of my concerns is people parking not only on Columbus, but around on Denver Street, because that does happen now to the um, apartments that are further down. People actually pull into the neighborhood and park there on our street, and then they'll walk down and around the corner. Um, don't know why they do it, doesn't happen very often. The fact is that it happens. My other concern is people parking not only in the neighborhood, but cutting through all of our yards to get to their apartments. If there's a couple trees, if there's a couple bushes, that's fine. But if it's not a solid barrier to stop them from the temptation of cutting through my yard or my neighbor's yard to take that shortcut instead of walking all the way around and go into the apartment complex, that's something that can happen. Um, I can tell you from an apartment complex, I'm sorry, from a neighborhood I lived in several, several years ago, we lived across the street from an apartment complex and we found the same thing happening. We had people parking all on the street in front of our house, so we didn't have a lot of room to park. In addition, we also observed people parking blocks away and cutting through our yard. So this is something I'm concerned from experience, and I'm worried that based on um, the layout of how things are, that that's something that could happen as well. Not to mention the school that we talked about that's uh, gonna be right there on uh, Childs in Nebraska. I can tell you from, Right now, taking my kids to school, parents will park a block or a block two away, and they'll let their kids walk to them to avoid the traffic, to help kind of ease that congestion. But the problem with that is now they're within the neighborhoods, and I can easily see that happening if traffic, <coughs> excuse me, if traffic increases with the amount of people that will now be there, I can easily see parents just turn in the corner and telling their kids, okay, you know what, go ahead and cross the street and walk down the street and we'll pick you up or however that looks. It's something that I observe now at both of my kids' schools when I go to pick them up. I always pass the same parents and they're always a block or two parked away 
And by the time I roll out of the school, taking my kids um, home, I see the same kids walking to these cars. So I know that it's something that parents do. They do try to help alleviate that congestion by perking further into um, the neighborhood. And it's something I can easily see parents wanting to do once, the, excuse me, <clears throat> once the school is in full effect to try and help ease that um, congestion. So those are, those are a few of the concerns that I have in addition to the ones that my neighbors voiced as far as the parking, the congestion, the traffic, um, not to mention the echo. Um, nobody does abide by the speed limits on Nebraska or Child. I can tell you we leave about 15 minutes early because trying to get out of our neighborhood onto Child sometimes is just a feat in itself. People fly down that street. They fly around Nebraska. And if Nebraska isn't a good route, um, some of my neighbors can probably attest to, they fly through the neighborhood and they cut through the neighborhood um, just to kind of bypass that if they have to. So that's something that we currently deal with and I'm worried that that's gonna, <coughs> excuse me, that problem's gonna probably double once we add a population to that and vehicles um, on top of that. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else in the public that would like to speak regarding 14B? Please uh, come forward, state your name and address. Hi, my name is uh, Brandon Gunn. I also live at 1105 Denver Street. Uh, I'm not really trying to cheat the system here, but my concerns are a little bit of a different nature. Um, so with the school coming out um, on that illustration uh, provided by our neighbor, thank you for that. With buses coming out there, uh, I just want to reinforce the concern with on-street parking, uh, mostly because Last week, I went to pick up my son, and I came down Nebraska. I exited on, uh, what is that, Cornhusker Ave? Exited there, came down, and uh, got about four inches from a head-on collision with someone turning out of the apartment complex down the road that's already there. That would have been much more avoidable um, had he been able to see the road because there's already on-street parking there. Uh, and that blocks a lot of view. There's a lot of view blocked up on Childs, so that's, uh, that's a big concern. But the other primary concern I wanted to point out, uh, at least for me, is not Cowie Street. You can't see it in this uh, picture, but up Denver Street, if you follow that hill as it goes up towards the other exit to Childs, there's a lot of police activity up there. Um, we had police up there once every you know month to two months and it causes a change in traffic for the next couple weeks it's not so much about how much traffic comes through as what kind comes through uh you know people fly down denver street they fly down up and down nebraska in winter it's a mess if there's any ice at all on the road and that's a big concern mostly because of the school going in on the other side there's already a bunch of kids who play uh, at the apartment complex uh, down the road, down Nebraska. They play outdoors all the time. They'll ride their bikes in the street and people just go flying up and down the roads, you know, sometimes as, as much as 50 miles an hour. And having that, uh, having that happen and then adding to that with all these apartments going in, especially in wintertime, I just don't see that going well. Um, and I don't see I don't see it reflecting into the neighborhoods very well. I don't see it reflecting into the apartments uh, down the road very well at all. So I wanted to to bring that up, uh, and that's that's really all I had. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else wishing to speak regarding fourteen B? Please come forward. Chief, do you see anybody coming down the hall or is there? Okay, nobody uh, else wanting to speak? Seeing nobody, I'll close the public hearing on 14B. Um, just want to take a stab at a couple of these questions. Um, and if uh, maybe Tammy can help or Chief can help on a couple of them. Uh, but fence seems to be a concern. 
Um, maybe Larry, if you want to. I'm not sure where you're at on the fence, if that was a possibility. Um, well, I guess the aesthetics we believe would be substantially better without the fence. And I would also point out that I think that easement, OPVD easement's 100 feet wide. We cannot have a fence within the easement area. So you'd have a fence and then a giant gap and then a fence again, which I I don't think, I think landscaping in Birmingham is substantially better. I'd rather work with the neighbors and come up with a landscape plan. And again, as, as Tammy mentioned, we have a landscape maintenance agreement. I'd rather work on the landscaping and and make the neighborhood happy that way as opposed to a fence what i heard the, the not so much the aesthetics but it sounds like maybe they're worried about foot traffic or crossover from residents into yards and you know I, I i don't see that actually because there's no place to go um i mean you would be coming into the neighborhood for really no reason um if you want, I can go through a whole bunch of yeah, stuff. But 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 to see me, what the, the, thought the, was. the pedestrian crosswalk, for example, is at Columbus Avenue. Um, that's where it's designated. There shouldn't be, and we're not permitting or or making it uh, convenient for people to do any pedestrian crossing mid block from uh, Childs all the way to Columbus Avenue. Uh, really, the main pedestrian crossing should be at Columbus Avenue, and we agree with that. Um, so I, we don't think it's safe to have pedestrian crossing mid block. So I don't see that really occurring, but at least we're not going to promote it and by our one, design. That's one of the other questions was I heard common theme is the school drop off. I know Bellevue public schools that we have that issue on most of our, our elementary schools, but they do a good job as far as having, um, crossing guards and, uh, out directing traffic and it works pretty well but we have the same issues you know I'm not sure about Omaha whether whether they do something similar but um, I think Chandler I've seen crossing guards there Chandler view um, so I think we're counting on the schools to take care of that helpful help with that problem uh, traffic um, Tammy I'm, I'm assuming the bus turning um, that's been looked at or is there enough room is there any issue with that? Yes, and Mr. Dunn and I were just discussing that. So from the school's layout and their plan, um, the bus entry and exit will be on the east side of the school building. Um, there will be pickup and drop off for parents on the other side of the building. Um, one of the things that was looked at with the traffic study was the busing. Um, it was discussed extensively when the school went in, what routes the bus will take. Um, you know, how they will conduct drop off and pick up as well. Um, again, there's enough room on Nebraska Drive for the parking. Um, our public works department is okay from an engineering perspective with the parking. I guess my opinion is when I first started working with this developer, I told them I liked the idea of parking on Nebraska Drive so that they could amp up the landscape buffer yard and they could minimize the impact that way um, if they had the parking on Nebraska Drive, which is wide enough for it to happen um, and can happen from an engineering perspective. That was better than trying to cram more stalls onto the site and allowing for a larger than required buffer yard, more landscaping than required um, to hopefully minimize the impact on neighbors that way. Okay. Uh, let's see if I have any more for you. The oil, um, talked about oil. I mean, that, that probably happens on every parking lot. I mean, oil running off. Yep. Go ahead, Larry. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, the whole idea behind detention basins are two things, right? Water quality and water quantity. So these detention basins are designed to take care of both of those items, and they're required to under our partnership that we have, you know, between all the various uh, municipalities and the NRD. So it's designed um, in accordance with those you know, specifications. So the idea is to provide for water quality and water quantity. So that's what it's there for. Okay, thank you. Uh, students view, um, I mean, I understand, you know, we understand that the view is gonna change. It's not gonna be a, you know, it's not gonna be a green space anymore. Um, that happens with development. But again, these council members have to decide and they're listening to everything everybody's saying. Um, and I just wanna make sure we're addressing 
uh, what we need to address. Um, obviously, the Ch uh, Childs Road, there's a, I am concerned about traffic if, uh, you know, visibility. So we just need to make sure that uh, our planning and everything's paying attention to that. And, and uh, we're not creating a, a big hazard as well. Um, are there any other questions that the council members have at this time? Councilwoman Welch. Um, two things. Um, Tammy, when, when you look at this design, in your background, one of the concerns of the people that live there is the amount of accidents and those types of things. Is that taken into when you guys are looking at this full design and approving it or, or recommending it? Yes, so a traffic study was done and um, Perhaps the engineers in the room can better answer that question, but that's all. That's items that we look at when we consider design. Um, what you're seeing here represents um, several months of work between the city and the developer before it came to public hearing. Um, and what what we look at is these access points, locations, how it will fit into the neighborhood, and how that will work with traffic. So okay. you would not be seeing this design if our public works department and our engineers were not okay with it from an engineering perspective. And we wouldn't put it in front of you and say we were okay with it. I understand that. I'm just wanting to make sure accident reports are included in the traffic study, not just the Maybe. counting of cars and that kind of stuff. I don't know if uh, Mr. Pence or either Mr. Dunn can answer that. Reagan Pence with Plant Um I am a uh, project manager for the project, the site development. I am not a traffic engineer um, by trade, but the, um, I, I don't believe we've, we've gone back and done historical research on the, the traffic accidents of that area. Uh, but I can tell you with regards to the child in Nebraska Drive, um, I believe there were some concerns about the visibility and the sight lines of Nebraska and Childs and Childs and Columbus. And where we are located, we are sitting at much higher elevations. So on child's uh, exit and entrance, for example, we're sitting 10 feet higher than the Nebraska child's intersection. And then we're sitting 15 feet higher on the entry into the project at, off of Nebraska. And it gives a much better uh, visibility than the actual intersections of Columbus and child's. Okay, thank you. And then um, Larry did, your group or anyone do anything with regards to vacancy rates in the in the city of Bellevue as to, you know, are we looking at, I mean, it may or may not be the 107 units are full like this just based on average vacancy rates and that type of thing. Do we know what some of the vacancy rate numbers are? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I they did do a marketing study um, with a national um, firm that does those types of studies, and they showed a seven percent vacancy rate in the the city of Bellevue. So actually, that's relatively low, I think. So that just means that th these types of units are in need because Correct. we have such a low vacancy rate right. in our city. Okay. Correct. Good information. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Pricer. Larry, you repeatedly have shied away from a fence. Can you tell me what the objection to a fence is? Is it cost? What What's the issue? It, it, it really is more about aesthetics. Um, is what I understand, and I really, again, you know, this is a $15 million investment for this developer. They have every interest and motivation to make sure that their tenants are the, the best they can be and that the property's maintained well. And they, you know, screen their tenants. Um, I don't see that there's any place to go west of the apartment project into the the neighborhood at least unless you're on a public sidewalk so the the fence just doesn't is not appealing to them from an aesthetic perspective we think it looks substantially better with green space and and nice landscaping and the fence just kind of breaks it up when we don't see that there's any real risk it's not a financial uh, thing but we don't see any real risk of anyone really 
wandering off from the multifamily housing project into the adjacent residential neighborhood to the west without using the public sidewalks. There's I don't, just nowhere to go except someone's backyard, which would be trespassing, right? I don't think their concern was so much the people in the apartment complex coming through as when school lets out, people, kids are going to take the shortest route. And their concern is cutting through that apartment complex and then through their uh, yards into the neighborhood uh, to go home after school. Which they could do right now. <laughs> well, that's right, because there's no so, development. Right. That's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> right. I mean, we're not encouraging people to do that. And we're making every uh, opportunity for them to cross at Columbus Avenue and not um, in, you know, through our particular project. So. Mm -hmm. Can you stop everybody from everything? Probably not, but we would certainly not encourage it. That's for sure. And the design, I don't think encourages that. But that, if it that kept... answered my question. Thank you, Larry. I have Thank a second you. one, and that is the issue was brought up about the existing trees along the west. Uh, some of those are nice trees, but the couple nicer ones, I think, are right where the building's going to be. So I know those trees are going. But what about back closer to the property line? Do we know anything about any of those trees being saved that would be in that buffer area? Reagan will be able to answer that for you. Yeah, we, we would do our best to preserve um, some of the older growth trees, but um, at the end of the day, um, if there are trees that are affected by the grading activities and they are off property, they may be affected. But we are going in with a large amount of new trees, so there is going to be some age diversity. So as some of the existing older trees start to die off, we do have new trees coming up. Okay, thank you. And, well, and then, Ms. Palm, if I could ask you, in terms of putting in a fence, there's setbacks and requirements. So what I'm understanding is the fence would be closer to the apartments. The neighbors would rather it's closer to their property line. Can the fence be put back on the property line and then the buffer in the middle so the aesthetics can block out the fence from the apartment owners and yet the neighbors get the benefit of a fence? That could be a possibility. Um, fence is not a requirement per the zoning ordinance in this type of situation. Um, the zoning ordinance requires the trees and the plantings, not sure. the fence for multifamily um, use. So, but yes, that's a possibility um, that you could you could arrange it in that manner. Okay, I would like that to be considered. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Would there be parking on both sides of Nebraska Avenue? No, just on the one side. Okay. Um, you, you you made a comment and it sort of jogged what I remember when the school board or the when OPS was here trying to present building that uh, school you mentioned that the buses would be on the east side of the school and how did they say that they would then exit that property and where would they go once they hit Childs it seems to me that they said they would then go down to Fort Crook that was my recollection as well. Right. They so, would utilize Fort Crook. That was the yeah. preferred route. So the buses on the east side is probably something of a plus here that they're Correct. not on the on the west side. Correct. Um, and then one just a little note where they're talking about a crosswalk at Columbus in Nebraska. If you go on the east side, there's not. I'm looking at Sarpy County, and it doesn't look like there's a sidewalk. I'm glad OPS, you mentioned that. OPS there, will have a sidewalk. There will be, yes. The school put in a sidewalk, and the city, um, that has been discussed through the Public Works Department, the city will be putting a sidewalk along that property so that there will be a connection because the only disconnect after OPS comes in will be across the park ground that we have on the park to the north of the school property. So we will put in that sidewalk so that connection is made. That's, that's in the plan so that there will be sidewalk all along that east side of Nebraska Drive. And that's why that crosswalk becomes imperative because then you will have sidewalk that goes up to that crosswalk. Okay. And that's where we will encourage students and pedestrians to cross. And that's part of the reason for having the bump outs as well um, is to kind of funnel everything to the north there to utilize that crosswalk. So our recollection is buses on the east side would try to I don't know the word they use, but what their goal would be is then to go down to Fort Crook 
and then take yes. the kids. Because part of the agreement with the school was that they were going to bus all the students or offer busing to all the students on that east side of yeah. Work Road. So that's the primary direction that they're coming from. And one last question. Is Child's Road, is there even wide enough to put a turning lane if down the road it would be needed to go into the apartment complex? So what I'm saying is like a center lane. Well, you know, if you're going, say, uh, eastbound, you can go into a turning lane and turn north into the apartment complex. Is there enough land there if that would ever come to a point of needing it? Because Child's Road is not the best road. I can't say that we've looked at that okay. yet. Uh, as far as the current width, uh, it wouldn't facilitate that. Um, it is something we could look into. I think the idea has some merit, so we could look a little into that, creating a center turning lane. And maybe cost share with the developer? No, uh, just, that, I, I, that I would, would ask that. That could be a possibility. At least look would, at it to see if there's a width there. Discussions. Okay, thank you. Dean, thank while you. you're up there, please. Could you let me know what the updates, what is looked at for Child's Road for the future? That's an asphalt. It's no curbing. It's not a very wide road. Uh, when you're driving east from the west, there is a rise there. I think the turn lane is, is important. But also coming out of Nebraska Ave, are there going to be turn lanes there too? I'm, I'm wondering, one, what the plans for the road and the road bed and the grade of it is for the future. And two, dealing with all this additional traffic, how we allow that traffic to flow through the most smoothly. Well, I can tell you that Child's Road was recently resurfaced in 2018 as part of our major street resurfacing project. So the surface is fairly new. Um, Long-term plans, uh, we currently don't have anything in, in our six-year plan to do anything more to Child's Road at this time. So as, far, as far as addressing the uh, right turn, um, I do know that Child's Road has a little extra width on the north side, and that was originally striped off for pedestrians, but that may be something that we have to look at too if we look, look at a reconfiguration through that area. As far as the grade of Childs, I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head. That'd be something that I'd have to look a little more in depth at. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Cook, uh, just to further answer on your question about those buses, if you remember right, we talked about those buses heading down to Fort Crook and the short uh, backup lane when that light is red, that they'd be too close to those railroad tracks. And Superintendent Logan told us that those buses would come out, go up to Nebraska Ave and down across to Chandler Road and cross the railroad tracks at Chandler. So it was not to be backed up on Child's Road. Uh, they will be going up and across Nebraska Avenue. Councilwoman Welch. Just last thing, Larry. Um, it sounds like the developer is trying to do everything they can to be good neighbors in this area, correct? Uh, y yes, I would absolutely agree okay. with that. Okay, so is there, and Tammy, you don't have to come up to the podium, you can just shake your head one way or the other. Is there the possibility that we could say, okay, this is gonna happen, they put the berm up, they put the trees up, and it looks pretty nice, but yet there's still some issues, and the developer agrees that with, you know, within a certain amount of time frame, if there's still some issues that the developer says, okay, we'll put up a fence type of thing. Is that a possibility? I think if that's a decision you're going to make, it should be made now as part of the site plan approval. I think it gets kind of dicey to leave it up to interpretation. Um, again, this ends up being a site plan approval request. They are requesting the overlay, so that would be something to be discussed now during this process. 
Okay, good to know. Thank you. Hold on, Tammy. Um, I think I missed one question Mr. Corvo had, and that was the uh, building standards, the three Class A materials. Yes. Is that so that is something that is part of the um, building permit process. Um, they have to submit for the building permit per our design standards ordinance, or they can request a waiver in front of the design review board, but we hold them to those design standards as part of the building permit process, and that's something that's reviewed at that time. Okay, thanks. I just had one more thing for Tammy. Um, I think, Larry, you hit on it, um, but it was pretty quick, I think. The fence, you can't have the fence in the utility easement. So you would have, Correct. if yeah. you could just show where the fence is and then maybe where the gap is. Yeah, and Larry makes a good point. You know, if you do a fence, you can't do it within that large easement. So right. you're going to have a gap no matter what. And that could potentially imply that since there's no fence there, maybe it's a walkway. Correct. Um, if, if you don't have a consistent fence the whole I way. I think that would be one major issue with having them require a fence because you can't, OPPD is not going to let you put that fence across the easement. So. But you could put a berm. Correct. To deter people jumping over the top of it, so to speak. With razor wire. <laughs> Sorry? With razor wire. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, we are making a berm and with the landscaping, so that's already part of the plan. And I believe that there's already fencing up from this property. The people that have uh, property, I think when I drove by there, I could see some fencing already back there. So it's just their responsibility. Right. And, and, and nothing prevents the neighbors from putting up their own fencing. Um, I suppose they could do that if they, they want to. Um, Councilman Cook? I don't know what's going to happen as far as, you know, if we'll have more public speaking on the zoning request, but I would ask that you have four or five owners that spoke here. I don't know if you could give them your name and phone number or even try to get together and meet with them because we're getting a lot of information from them. We've got... Uh, this was written by one uh, lady. We got another one that we were given to today. Uh, even the planning co uh, commission meeting minutes, there's several pages of where many residents came up and talked. I would ask at, le at least, would you reach out to them, at least maybe try to meet them and maybe talk about some of the more of the specifics of how things could be addressed. Sure. A lot of it is fear, I think. You know, it's been a green space. If, if there's kids, it's probably been used a lot by kids. And, and we run into this all the time where there's green space and we know someday it's gonna get developed. It's gonna get developed. If you don't own it, it's gonna get developed. And the fear is now someone wants to develop it and now the, all the unknowns and what ifs and is this gonna happen and that gonna happen. I think if you meet with the neighbors and you calm some of those fears and tell them how you're gonna address some of their concerns, I think it helps a lot and, and makes this project a lot easier. Right, and I appreciate that, and we are willing to do that. I mean, if you go a step further on this particular development, which isn't like a lot of other developments, a lot of other developments are zoned ag, and they're not platted, and they're adjacent to a single family neighborhood. In this particular case, it's actually zoned what it currently is being requested to be zoned, and it's been undeveloped and platted for 50 years. So, I mean, it's been there a long time with that zoning classification on it, you know, which is, a, is a, I've never actually run into that before <laughs> as far as 50 years of having something undeveloped and vacant, but yet zoned and subdivided. Okay. All right. I don't have a timer on the council member, so I guess that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, uh, just for the record, I'm gonna enter the two letters from Ms. Corvo and Ms. Duff into the record and I also have one from the Sarpy County Board of Commissioners. Um, Chairman Kelly wanted me to read it into the record so I'll read uh, the wording into the record. There's a lot of stats here so we'll file that as well but um, uh, it came to Dear Ms. Palm, please consider this correspondence as formal opposition to the proposed tax increment financing on the above referenced project. We recognize that current taxes will flow to the various taxing entities however what is conspicuously absent in your report is the $1,732,956, which will not be realized by the various taxing entities. Instead, it will flow directly into the pocket of a private developer. 
Moreover, the type and density of development you are proposing creates a high demand for government services. Approval of TIF on this development will take away from multiple taxing entities and place it in the pocket of the private developer in the following amounts. Um, again, uh, it says the board it was on this particular reference property, so I don't know if they voted on it. Seems like they voted on it. Um, but I know it's a general statement of the county that uh, they don't like TIF projects. Um, I would uh, tell you that the city of Bellevue, when uh, these come through the city of Bellevue, we pay close attention to that. We, we are not handing it out. We've turned several projects away and said that's, that's not gonna happen. Um, so this is a project that I think uh, being out there for 50 years, um, TIF does qualify and uh, I think it's a good use for it because it could go another 10, 50 years, whatever, vacant. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll put that in the record and uh, we will move on to item 14B1, resolution number 2020-42, approve and authorize mayor to sign agreement with Southwoods Manager LLC to implement the redevelopment plan. Councilman Shannon. Mr. Mayor, at this time, I would make a motion to table this resolution until the November 3rd council meeting. That will allow us to uh, consider the other item and then look at this. Okay. I'll second it. Motion by Pat Shannon, seconded by, sorry, motion by Councilman Shannon, seconded by Councilman Cook uh, to table until the next meeting, which is, what is it? December 2nd, November, November 3rd. Uh, any discussion? Councilman Preister. Thank you, Mayor. I, I support that motion. I just question, we've got people here for a public hearing. Do we carry the public hearing forward then on it at that time? Seems better to have the public hearing and after the hearing, then delay it and a vote action. But I, we just had the public hearing. Brief. But we were going to allow some people to come back up for this particular one. It's, yeah, it's for a different item. So the public hearing was already opened on resolution 2020-42, which is right. basically item 14B. Um, so the motion would be appropriate at this time that was made by Mr. Shannon. The other item that is related is 12, B. B, which will be opened up for public hearing again for anybody who wants to come speak. Okay. I and that would be on the sure. ordinance, not the resolution. Right. Okay. That clarifies. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, motion by Councilman Shannon, second by Cook to table until November 3rd. Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. Item 11, ordinances for adoption, third reading. 11A, ordinance number 4007, an ordinance to amend section 6-117 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to the regulation of bees violations, revocations. Susan, would you read that ordinance description, please? An ordinance to amend section 6-117 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to same violations, revocations to repeal such section as heretofore existing and to provide for the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Councilman Cook. Thank you, Mayor. I'll make a motion we approve ordinance number 4007. I'll second that. Motion by Cook, seconded by Welch. Any questions or comments on the ordinance? Seeing none, please vote. voting on the bees ordinance. All voting yes. Thank you. Item 11B, ordinance number 4008, an ordinance to amend sections 9-17 and 9-18 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to elections. Susan, would you read the ordinance description, please? Ordinance number 4008, an ordinance to amend sections 9-17 to 9-18 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to proceedings for election and notice of election 
repeal such section as heretofore existing and to provide for an effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. Councilman Preister. Mayor, thank you. I move to approve ordinance 4008. Motion by Preister, seconded by Stenson. Any comments or questions on ordinance 4008? Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you, item 11C. Uh, ordinance number 4009, an ordinance to amend sections 15-194 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to unlawful acts, sale or rental. Susan, would you read that ordinance description? Ordinance number 4009, an ordinance to amend section 15-194 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to unlawful acts, sale or rental, repeal such section as heretofore existing and to provide for the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. Councilman Stenson. Make motion we approve ordinance number 4009. Second. Motion by Stenson, seconded by Preister to approve ordinance 4009. Any questions or comments? Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you, item 11D, ordinance number 4010, an ordinance to repeal section 20-5 of Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to swearing, cursing, etc. Susan, would you read that ordinance description, please? Ordinance number 4010, an ordinance to amend section 20-5 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to swearing, cursing, etc. to repeal such section as heretofore existing and to provide for the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. Councilman Preister. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move to approve ordinance number 4010. Second. Motion by Preister, second by Welch to approve ordinance number 4010. Any questions or comments? Please vote. Not me. All voting yes. Item 11E, ordinance number 4012. Would you, Susan, would you read that ordinance, please? Ordinance number 4012, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the city of Bellevue, Nebraska, as provided for by Article 3 of ordinance number 3619, by changing the zone classification of land located at or about 1001 Fort Kirk Road North, more particularly described in section one of the ordinance and to provide an effective date. Councilman Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Tammy, would you give us an update on this? Can we have a motion first? Yes, I'll make a motion. We approve ordinance number 4012. I'll second that. Motion by Cook, seconded by Welch to approve ordinance number 4012. Now we can have a discussion. I believe you're referring to the conditional use permit that was previously proposed by the applicant. And also the UPS. Yes. Um, there was two separate applications um, by the applicant. One was for the rezoning to facilitate a possible conditional use permit for UPS to park trucks there. Um, after the planning commission meeting, the um, UPS did withdraw their application for the CUP. They decided to look elsewhere. Um, that is no longer on the table. It was withdrawn. However, this particular applicant decided to move forward with the rezoning only. Thank you. Um, here, here's my feeling. UPS was going to come up there and, and have those trucks there, and they have withdrawal from uh, following through on that. And my feeling is is by changing the zoning, there's not a project that we're aware of what's going to go in. And tomorrow, if we approve this, I guess what I should cl clarify it first. I'm gonna ask, I asked that we approve it, but I'm gonna ask the council not to vote for it. And my reason is because UPS pulled out of this. I think that if the owner wants to bring another project forward, a microbrewery, a car lot sells, I think they should come back for the zoning change so that we know at that time what's gonna go in. Right now, we could approve it and the uh, UPS could bring their trucks in there tomorrow 
and say, well, we have a change of thought. And I personally would have a problem with that. And I would explain that if we were gonna go down that road. But I'm asking that we don't approve it. I'm asking that we vote no. And that way the developer or the owner of the property, if they get another business that needs a zone change, I think they should come back to us and ask for that zone change so we know it goes there in the future. Just Thank for point you. of yep. clarification, so if a change of zone was approved that doesn't green light UPS to park trucks and trailers there, that's a conditional use under the VGH zoning. So they would still have to come in and get city council approval before they could do that because it's not a permitted use. So they would have to go back through the public hearing process through planning commission, city council. It's not a permitted use in BGH. It's a conditional use to park those trucks and trailers. And I'm just concerned with other BGH things that could come in. I mean, he brought it forward for a change of zone, from my understanding, was for UPS trailers. They withdrew. That's not going to occur. So I'm just asking that if down the road there's another project that needs a zoning change, that they come back to us, present their idea to us, and we vote on it at that time. That, and I'm going to tell you, I went up there, and those two schools in that South Roads occupy a lot of space, a lot of that parking lot. And I'm telling you, it, it was even difficult for me to maneuver around on the back side of that with uh, uh, cars of employees, teachers, and administrators in the schools, along with the other businesses, and uh, the playgrounds that kick way out in the parking lots for the kids. Uh, having trailers there, I don't know if that would have been a good mix, but I just think we leave the zoning as is because the project went away. Not to mention OPS is uh, going to be using that for the next 10 years as well. So going to add a lot of, lot more students, but yeah, I, so, would, I would agree uh, as with uh, Councilman Cook, uh, the justification for changing the zoning is gone. They have presented no new justification for this. So until such time as uh, a justification exists for changing the zoning, I'm not going to vote for this. Councilman Preister. Thank you, Mayor. I, I would concur with both of my colleagues. I think at this point, the schools are the biggest concern for me. I'm grateful to UPS for pulling the conditional use permit and, and even moving this forward because I wasn't going to support it. But in this case, I too would rather have the zoning changed when we know of an actual project rather than do it now and expand the use that could be there even if it does have to come back so i concur with my colleagues any other comments or questions so we have a motion by cook with the caveat not to approve and a second by welch oh brie I talked to Councilman Cook prior to the meeting and told him that I would prefer a positive motion instead of a negative motion. So that's why he made a motion to approve. So just to clarify, if you vote yes, you are approving the rezoning to BGH. If you vote no, you're saying you don't want to approve the zoning change. Yes. Correct. And that's, yes, they're asking to vote no. Right. Questions, comments, please vote. All voting no. Okay, thank you. Item 12A, ordinances for public hearing. Second reading, ordinance number 4013. Susan, would you read that ordinance description, please? Ordinance number 4013, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the city of Bellevue, Nebraska, is for as provided for by Article 3 of Ordinance Number 3619, by changing the zone classification of land located at or about 45th Street and Looking Glass Drive, more particularly described in Section 1 of the ordinance, and to provide an effective date. Thank you. My uh, legal counsel just left. And <laughs> Okay. Uh, item 
12A1, request to approve a preliminary plat for lots 122 through 124, Bell Lago South. And then open both 12A and 12A1. And I will open both 12A and 12A1 up for public hearing. And looks like Larry's back with us. Yes, thank you, <clears throat> Mayor, members of the council, Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant. If you recall, some of you were on the council when Bell Lago South and Bell Lago uh, was approved by this council a few years back. One of the requirements when we were uh, rezoning and replatting Bell Lago South was there be this extension of looking glass to 45th to really provide three additional, well, three total access points through Clearwater Falls until such time, of course, as looking glass will get extended to 48th Street. But, but for now, um, this was an attempt to alleviate some of the traffic through the eastern part of Clearwater Falls. So this is consistent with that, and, and I have a couple exhibits. Um, this is the original Bell Lago South, and I highlighted a couple uh, points on the Bell Lago South uh, final plat that's actually been recorded now and is in the process of being developed. And this will be the next exhibit I'll show. <laughs> Perfect. Got it. So this is the final plat that was approved by the city council a couple of years ago. Again, the idea was, and in fact, in our subdivision agreement, you, the council, even approved um, the ability to use the power of eminent domain if we needed to to acquire this right of way uh, through the Malreo property uh, to make this extension to 45th Street. In, in We've actually entered into a voluntary purchase agreement, so we've come to an agreement with the, the neighbor and we we're all hopeful of that and that has happened. So there's a purchase agreement for this property with the property owner um, that is contingent, of, of course, on this uh, plat being approved um, tonight or, or the, at the next meeting when it is approved. By extending the right of way as we did looking glass and making the connection to 45th, we created this surplus kind of hiatus parcel that is of no value um, to the property owner. So what we were uh, able to do is just create three lots within that surplus property, and that's what's before you tonight as such. And again, this was all part of the original plan of Bell Lago South uh, and, and Bell Lago for that matter, is to make this additional extension. So with that, um, pretty simple. I'm here to answer any questions that you might have regarding this particular application. Any questions? Okay, public hearing is open, so hang around a minute. If there's anybody here to speak uh, for or against, ordinance number 4013, please come forward. Okay, seeing nobody come forward, I will close the public hearing. The third reading and vote on 12A and 12A1 will be November 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. here at the council chambers. Item 12B, ordinance number 4015. Susan, would you read that ordinance description, please? An ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the city of Bellevue, Nebraska, as provided for by Article 3 of ordinance number 3619 by changing the zone classification of land located at or about Childs Road in Nebraska Drive, more particularly described in section one of the ordinance and to provide an effective date. Thank you, and we will also take item 12B1, request to approve a small subdivision plat for lot one, Southwoods, replat four. So I will open up the public hearing uh, on items 12B and 12B1. And hello, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant. I'll be relatively brief. I'll just kind of run through really quick. To just and then there's one thing that I wanted to address or have uh, uh, Reagan Pence address with respect to Childs Childs Road that we talked about. But again, this is a 4.52 acre parcel. Uh, it's currently undeveloped and has been subdivided and platted for over 50 years and still is vacant. It's currently three lots. Uh, lots. 9, 10, and 11 of the original Southwoods. The uh, small subdivision that you're considering 
tonight will be a lot combination of those three lots into lot one Southwoods replat four uh, along with the uh, proposed rezoning and remember the the rezoning is currently rg8 and so you got two lots i believe that are rg8 plan subdivision currently and one lot that is rg8 so when you do this lot combination you have to have one consistent zoning across uh, the one lot uh, that's combining the three. So all we're really doing is adding the plan subdivision onto one lot. Again, it's already zoned for what we're proposing tonight. Um, again, it's a 107 unit multifamily housing project. Uh, we talked about the what the maximum density could be if there was a, obviously had to be a parking structure to, to fit more units on there based upon the size and configuration of this particular lot. Uh, again, there's two buildings that contain 36 units each one contains 35 units with the leasing uh, facility in that one and that's the one to the north uh, along nebraska drive um, it, again we meet all the site regulators um, under the plan subdivision as we've worked out with the planning staff um, we have the 30-foot buffer on the the south and the and the along the neighborhood and then obviously the buffer gets larger to about 60 feet and then 39 feet uh, further to the north. So um, as far as the unit mix, I think we talked about this, but there are 64 efficiency one bedroom units. There's 35 two bedroom units and there's eight three bedroom units. Again, average rental rate of $1,100 a month. So they're not uh, inexpensive units for being an average. Uh, there is a clubhouse as we discussed on the north side of the one building that stands alone and that has a number of amenities including clubhouse fitness center uh, courtyard with outdoor gathering spaces and uh, there's also the detached garage parking uh, we talked a lot about this as well the the parking spaces provided and this includes the 22 stalls on nebraska drive are 209 parking stalls the required number of parking stalls is 214 so we're not far off and with the planned um, subdivision you can get there um, again we talked about surface parking being 137 stalls uh, garage parking being 50 uh, uh, garages detached and uh, on-street parking of the 22 on nebraska drive for a ratio of uh, 1.95 parking spaces per unit well one thing we didn't talk about is the building materials uh, there is 60 percent brick and glass which is the primary materials uh, there's 40% secondary materials, which is cement board, lab siding, cement board reveal siding, and cement board batten siding. There's asphalt shingles, uh, metal soffit and fascia, metal deck railings. And it's really a, a class A um, apartment project is with respect to the material choices that they have here. Um, they are expecting or hoping with this approval on hopefully November 3rd that um, the construction will begin in 2021 with a 16 month uh, build out. Again, the project is consistent with your comprehensive development plan. It's actually consistent with the existing zoning that is on the property today, uh, except for the one lot uh, to the north that's being now combined into the one lot that doesn't have the plan subdivision designation on it. So the zoning really in many respects is in place except for the lot combination, which requires the rezoning of the one lot to RG8 PS. Um, I did want Reagan to talk a little bit because it's, I think it's pertinent to the zoning. Just the, we talked about potentially having a dedicated uh, left-hand turn movement off Childs into the, Childs into the site. And, and actually, I don't think there's enough right away to do that. And, and think about what you would have to do to widen it. You can't just widen it in one little space and have the, sort of this jagged edge you would have to really taper it, which actually would probably require that you um, that it condemn right away um, further west of the, the property, potentially on both sides of the property. Uh, also, uh, potentially even to the east of Nebraska Avenue, because there's just not enough right away to, to make that work. Because you can't, like I said, you can't just all of a sudden show up and have a dedicated left. It has to taper out and taper back in. So I think it's a lot more significant uh, than you think as far as trying to make that a possibility. I did want Reagan to share with you some um, site lines that he has. Um, um, 
with respect to Child's Road in relationship to the proposed project. So I'll turn it over to him really quick and then we're here for questions. Okay. And Reagan on the right side of that podium is a button you can raise it. So you don't, you're not bending over, you make my back hurt, but <laughs> whatever's comfortable. <laughs> I know that problem quite a bit sometimes. Um, Reagan Pence, uh, Lamp Rainier, 14710 West Dodge Road, uh, Omaha. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, everything uh, Larry said, and you know, just to reiterate, um, going to a, a road widening project like that, because built, currently built um, at a narrow width would require chasing that back several blocks. You don't just expand it and then taper it back in. So that's a, that's a major city infrastructure uh, project, and uh, that has been built that way and zoned that way. And, and the infrastructure supports that net zoning. Um, with regards to the visibility, I do have some pictures. And in addition to that, I did make a site visit and I have some other pictures on my phone. Excuse me. This is uh, looking west, and sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, at the intersection into the the project, we are sitting at a much higher elevation uh, than we are at the the intersection of Nebraska and Childs. So the visibility is much better than sitting down at the bottom of the hill. And then right here is the visibility uh, looking down the hill as you're looking east. And uh, you know, as you can see, that's a that's a two lane uh, road section. And um, yeah, we, that's kind of where we're at. Okay, any questions? All right, public hearing is open um, on item 12B and 12B1. So if anybody uh, has anything to add from what they uh, discussed earlier, come on up. Please uh, state your name, address again, and Amy actually- Amy Reminder to sign in as well yes. if, you, if you didn't do that first time. So. Um, I did, but I didn't okay. get my address. All right. Okay, so Amy Corview, 2711 Columbus Avenue. I'll make this quick, I promise. <laughs> um, I just wanted to address a few things. Uh, we have, my, my family has owned that property since 1994. Yes, it has been nice to see an open field there. But we have known all these years that eventually something was gonna go there. Um, would I much rather have been houses? Yes. I never imagined that there would be a parking lot on the other side of my fence. That's what my issue is. Um, that's why we want a fence. The fence is not only for security, but it's also for noise. Um, there's gonna be an entrance on Nebraska Drive, and as people turn into that entrance, it's gonna go right into our backyard um, and we'll be able to see it from our deck. We'll also be able to see everybody and they'll be able to see us while we're out sitting on our deck and on our patio. Um, also, if you look at my house, the very corner that faces the basin, that's where our bedroom window is, which I know doesn't really matter, but we hear everything. So on top of the trains and already hearing enough traffic, we are going to hear car doors slamming, opening, shutting at all hours of the night. Um, that's one of the main reasons we are concerned about the noise and the fence and the trees. Um, the apartments, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't really care for apartments there. I'll deal with it. Like I said, we knew something eventually was gonna go there. That's not my issue. Um, I do wanna ask about the brim. Is there going to be a brim on our side as well? Larry on Lot Reagan. 12? Is there gonna be a? On Lot, on lot 12, is there gonna be a brim? Okay, so my question is our fence line, our fence is six foot high and we can see everything already on the other side. You guys are gonna raise that up another four feet. So, even if we put a 12 foot fence there, we're still gonna see everything on the other side. That's, so I, I guess we were, my husband and I were thinking, 
Either you build a brim up so we can put a fence on top of that brim, which, or berm, I'm sorry. My husband didn't come up here, but he knows all these words. But um, So we can build a fence on top so we don't see anything. Or if maybe you guys could work with us, one of our thoughts was if you put a standing garage down at the bottom of the parking lot there, which would be on the other side of our fence, that would um, stop the headlights coming in from our backyard, stop us from being able to see people in the parking lot, and also help with the noise. So I, I would like to, I'd, we'd be up for getting their um, phone number and working with them on trying to make this work. Okay. And, and we, we would love to hear back from you after that meeting yes. and uh, get your feelings on this because uh, anybody that's coming to the city asking us to give them $1.8 million of taxpayer money for this project should be willing to work with you and make you happy. Okay, well, I, I do appreciate that. I mean, we do want that to be our forever home. So we, you know, that was our goal when we decided to buy it from his parents. So um, I just would hate to have to try to move and have to try to move and sell it with an apartment complex and a parking lot right next door. Um, that would be very difficult. So thank you again for your concerns. Uh, do you want to give, him a, give her a card, Reagan, or something for contact and... Thank you. We'll provide them with your contact info as well. Thank you. Um, Deborah Duff, I live at 1107 Denver Street in Bellevue. Sorry, had my talking points. I never looked at them. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that I have, um, I understand this is going to be a pet-friendly apartment complex. Is that correct? Okay. Where... Is there going? Is there an animal? Is there an area or a pet area anywhere in the plans? I I haven't seen anything there. I've seen the charcoal or the the pit area. I've seen garages. You know, I mean, there's nice um, shrubbery, but I haven't seen any area that is designated pet friendly. So um, that was another concern that I had, considering that my yard is open and. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I go up in the field and walk my dog and pick this stuff up. So I love the field, you know, but um, another, and we've brought it up before, um, and it's just me, um, children's safety. I know we're going to be bringing in some more children into these apartments, and we have just um, minimized and made smaller the little park that was over right by the Chandler Point um, by the Chandler Point Apartments. So they've, they've cut down the space for children to play. I was just curious about the safety and, you know, it, has any thought been put to where the children who live in these apartments might go? Um, you know, and again, yeah, the, the noise barrier. I mean, you know, I, I've lived there. Come on, I had the house built. I've lived there for 41, going on 42 years. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I always knew something would go back there, and I'm not opposed to something going there as as long as I can feel safe again as long as I can feel like my yard is not going to be a walkway and um, as long as we can work with people and get stuff so that it's it's going to be pleasing to everybody so okay thank you okay anyone else here to speak uh, regarding ordinance number 4015 please come forward Okay, seeing nobody, I will close the public hearing. Um, question on that. Oh, the, you brought up the play area. I mean, there is a school across there, and I, I know in Bellevue the kids use the school playgrounds a lot, so that's probably a, that's probably a pretty big trade-off there for, for a park area. Pet area, um, do we want to address that, uh, Larry? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I, they, they didn't have a um, designated pet area per se, but we could have one. Um, the area that it could be in. This is where the buffer exceeds the 30 feet. 
So you could actually have a designated area here in that particular location. There was so much green space uh, within the development that the developer just figured that they'd be able to use you know, pretty much anywhere and not have necessarily a designated area. But there could be a designated area in this particular uh, space here, which is essentially and effectively still a green space, right? I mean, that's, it's just a place to have the, the pets kind of have a designated area for them to, to use. But we're more than willing to do that if they want to see a designated pet area. Okay, I think maybe a, just a restriction on, I mean, obviously the complex will have rules as far as picking up dog waste and stuff like that, so I would think. Correct, there'll be rules and regulations regarding this particular and There's project. ordinances that take care of that as well yes. if, uh, if there's a and, problem. So. And that's the other thing. I mean, we're required to meet all the site regulators with respect to lighting and noise and all of those things. So, I mean, all the lighting in the parking areas are going to be downcast. There will be no vertical or horizontal foot candle spillage uh, onto the adjacent right. properties. I mean, again, we have to comply with your uh, right. zoning regulations, and, and we're willing to do that. So, Okay. Any more questions for Larry? Councilman Pricer? Thank you, Mayor. L Larry, I agree on the, on the lighting, but as people pull in the parking lot, you're not controlling those lights and those will be shining back. So I would also concur with, there's plenty of green space as long as people pick up after their pets rather than having a designated area where the grass gets worn out and where it's overused in small spots. It's probably better to spread that out and have people walking, but making sure that they do pick up after their pets. I'm, there, there will be rules and regulations about that for sure within the area. Um, as far as the lighting from the parking area, you know, that's again why you have the berming, you know, so the lights go into the hill and that's why you have the landscaping to try to minimize those impacts. I mean, and, and we're willing to meet with them and talk about that and hopefully we can satisfy them as far as the amount of landscaping and berming that will be here. And, and hopefully we can talk about that the fence isn't necessarily the best option you know, from an aesthetic perspective. Okay. But in the end, I suppose, you know, they would put it in if they really wanted it. But but again, we think the aesthetics are better without it. And especially with that gap, that gap will look strange, I think. We'll let that discussion between you and the neighbors take place. Sure. We look forward yeah. to hearing Yeah, we hearing just exchange, soon. yes. And we just exchange cards and, and so we'll talk great. to them. But. You know, again, we're happy to work with them on, you know, satisfying them with respect to the landscaping in Birmingham. I suppose if a, a fence is what they want, you know, we can talk about that. I think any fence, though, we would probably want to, and this has happened before, we'd probably want to push it onto their property and let them maintain it. You know, we would just pay for it. So it becomes their fence. I, I also, you know, it should be uniform. So you know, right. they're afraid of our aesthetics. Well, we're afraid of their aesthetics as far as some fencing that, you know, is, you know, white picket here and, you know, split here. And, you know, sure. it, we would want it to be uniform so it looks nice. So we'll have that discussion with them. And hopefully November 3rd, we'll be able to come back and tell you what we have worked out. I would stay away from the designated pet spot because, I, I mean, you pointed right at the back of their yard again. So I, 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 that, that's, yeah. that was my thought. That's why we didn't have one. Um, so yeah. thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, third reading and vote on 12B and 12B1 will be November 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers. So thank you for... Um, presenting that and thank you for the public for coming out and sharing your concerns. Thank you. Yep. Item 12C, ordinance number 4014. Susan, could you read that ordinance, please? Ordinance number 4014, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the city of Bellevue, Nebraska, as provided for by Article 3 of ordinance number 3619 by changing the zone classification of land located at or about 25th Street and West Chandler Road, more particularly described in section one of the ordinance and to provide an effective date. Okay, with that, we'll uh, take item 12C1, request to approve a small subdivision plat for lots two and 2A, Kennedy Town Center, replat seven. So I will open up the public hearing 
Um, is the developer here or applicant? I'll let you start and then we'll follow up if there's anybody here in the public. Uh, my name is Mike Dedman. I'm with uh, Carlson Consulting Engineers at 7068 Ledgestone Commons, Bartlett, Tennessee. Okay, and I just want to clarify, we're going to open up the public hearing for 12C and 12C1. So yes, I'll sir. let you start if you want to say um, anything about it. Basically, the currently there's a 8.6 acre lot there that's a uh, uh, Kennedy Town Center uh, replat 4. Uh, it's presently zoned for RG20PS. And uh, we're requesting that the northern 2.54 acres of that site be rezoned to BG-PCO. That would create a commercial lot at the southeast quadrant of 25th and, uh, and Chandler. Um, we feel like that fits with the uh, corridor. Um, we have commercial across the street from us to the north. Um, you've got commercial immediately east uh, for that new convenience store uh, fueling station that went in. Uh, you've got a couple of car dealerships. Uh, you know, it's a pretty pretty short drag between uh, um, 25th and I-75, but certainly the the current trend, this, that's all going commercial along, uh, along mm -hmm. Chandler. And so uh, that's our request. Um, if you have any questions. I'll just start. I'll appreciate. I appreciate the commercial spot. I mean, that's what this administration's after is trying to develop those corners correctly and uh, maximizing our our revenue on those on those busier intersections. So, Councilman Pricer. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I I was just wondering. I think it's the more appropriate position for it because it's in keeping. But is there anything that you're looking at that would go in there? No, sir. This time uh, we're just. Uh, we don't have any plans for it. Um, we are looking at doing a multifamily development on the southern portion of the lot that sure. that's already zoned properly. Um, and, and part of the package, you can see the site layout for that multifamily. But as of right now, we don't have any specific plans or conceptual plans for what would happen with that commercial lot. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just hold on and I'll see if there's anybody in the public. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak uh, for or against um, ordinance number 4014 or item 12C and 12C1? Please state your name and Hi. address. I am Barb Lemoyne. My address is 7803 South 23rd Street in Bellevue. I am the uh, Kennedy Ridge Townhome president, HOA president. So uh, thanks for letting us have another second hearing. And I also wanted to extend thank you for the updated plan to the um, engineering firm and the uh, realtors of updating based on the recommendation by the planning committee. They approved um, some changes and they may made a couple small changes. So I, we appreciate you hearing us and our concerns and um, going forward from there. I do have one big concern that's still there. And in the Planning Commission's recommendation to you, it states on there that there is no traffic data analysis available. That is a big concern for our Kennedy Ridge development because currently we are on, we currently have, uh, our Vice President has worked directly with the Bellevue Police Department along Sauter, um, deal with the traffic and the noise leading to the car dealerships. It is a racetrack. And so they put up speed numbers, you know, to mon monitor the speed. And they've also, police have been monitoring physically along solder for traffic. Because what's going on, and as you mentioned before about the corner of 25th and Chandler, it's a major intersection. Because of those car dealerships, and especially when the school is going on at Chandler View, those hours, people miss and do not go to the corner at 25th and Chandler, and they cut through our development. So it adds to privacy, it adds to noise, it adds to traffic, it adds to risk. Because our community is a, very, is a small community, 
mainly of senior citizens or we have a mix, we have a mix, but a lot of them also have health issues and have ADA devices that they use to walk around and to go get the mail. Because our mail is on the south side of Sauter, which is on the opposite of where the development is, but yet just from a speed and traffic perspective, I'm just trying to lay the groundwork with the concerns with traffic and speed and noise, okay? So I wish there was a traffic analysis done so you guys could see that. So that when, especially when the school Chandler View's in there, parents, as other developments have talked, parents park in our development. And they park along and they go up the sidewalk and they either go across the street when the cross guards are there or whatever, but there are children there, um, minimal children in our development as of right now, but you add the apartments and that's gonna add children. Um, so, but right now the traffic increases when the parents park in our development. Now that the city, you took it over, it's one side parking of the street only. So then you add these people adding parking during certain times, it's minimal and I get that. But yet during those times, that also is at a time where employees leave the dealerships and they hit that street. So everybody's ooh, sorry, maneuvering back and forth around everybody. So, you know, with the mailboxes, with the school and everything, it just, it's just a concern, major concern. So what, um, and that's been brought up at other things. So the OPS, that's an elementary school with OPS, solder with that traffic from the dealership with noise. We've been working with uh, the car dealerships to help them ask their employees to minimize going through our development, time frame wise, let alone speeding and revving the engines and all that kind of stuff. Cause we, we, we've worked with them and they've done as best I think they can, you know, in approaching their employees and had special meetings and things like that. But still it's a, you add the departments apartments in there, it's gonna still add to that noise and confusion and all that kind of thing. So, um, those are my main concerns. So I would have recommend if you guys could do a traffic analysis through there, around there, especially adding the apartments to go to the school, um, let alone just additional traffic coming through the Kennedy Ridge townhomes addition. We would appreciate that very much so okay. so all right anyway thank you you bet Councilman Price thank you mayor I don't know that it really addresses your concerns but I'm wondering about the mailboxes and whether or not the post office has been contacted to locate them in a safer or a better place for the residents we have not contacted, to my knowledge, um, I know the HOA has not contacted the post office. It was the post office and the original developer of that um, Kennedy Ridge townhomes, um, they originally had mailboxes that were the individual independent mailboxes all over just as you entered from 25th going west on Sauter, just everybody as they joined and came into the community, they put up their own mailbox and put their own address, they were just ad hoc all over. So the developer paid for them to put it, the community four slot mailboxes, you know, where everything was locked and everything like that. And that's where they chose to put it. Because everything may, else in the development would have been on somebody's property. Sure, it may be set, but I just offer as a suggestion. We could reach out to them. That's, I don't see where that would probably be a problem, but we could ask. If sure. you're interested, it's for the I appreciate residents. that. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Ms. Blank on. Okay, public hearing still open on... Uh, thank you. I, yep, thank you. Item 12C and 12C1. Um, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Mayor, forgive me if I provide 30 seconds of background. <clears throat> Our neighborhood comes before you because we have been disappointed about reassurances made in past council meetings 
like last November, we were annexed and we were told that we particularly our Kennedy Ridge Town Center, you can, you can check the minutes, said that we would have lower MUD bills and lower property taxes. And so my property taxes just came in yesterday and they decreased by one cent per month. So I'll say only one sentence about that. That's pretty insulting because it smacks of gamesmanship. See, we told you your, that your property taxes were gonna go down and we're gonna give you that penny every month. <clears throat> so now we come before you um, and before the planning committee uh, commission recently to express that the development's main access from busy route 75 is only a one lane road when somebody parks on it and is only a one lane road when snow banks accumulate. And yet once again, we have been reassured that the street can accommodate 48 additional housing units. So in three or four years, I predict that you're gonna say, you guys were right, we have to widen that road. And so we need some assurances that the development plan have an easement or right of way or whatever you call it for widening the road that will be coming out of Deer Creek side of the curb and not out of our side of the curb. Um, secondly, I'll call your attention to this, this drawing. I hope it's large enough. This is just um, the apartments in the clubhouse up here. Um, here's Albert Street. I live right here. And um, I understand that there's, there's going to be a fence, although I just learned tonight that this fence is actually going to be pretty much hugging uh, Albert Street. And uh, I'm grateful that the, that the plans called for a fence on that south side of the development because um, I can't put a privacy fence on the inside of the curve because code won't allow it. So, but tonight I want to further request that there be no, no gate or no gap in this fence because that would encourage residents to park on the street. It's my cute little cars I got parked here because um, and that's gonna to contribute to those one lane problems that I, I mentioned earlier. So with only two parking spots per unit in this new development, um, residents may tell their friends, you know, hey, park on the road here. But as long as there's an unbroken fence here, I don't think that many people, they're, they're probably gonna be discouraged from having to park here, walk all the way around the fence, and then walk all the way back here. However, if you put a gate or a gap in this fence, I can assure you that many of them will be parking here so they can go right into the apartments. So in summary, I respectfully request one, that your approval will be contingent upon any future street widening to be coming out of the development's turf and not out of Kennedy Ridge Town Center property. And secondly, the stipulation that the fence have no gates or gaps along the south border. Um, however, based on a previous agenda item tonight, my two requests may be contradictory in that I guess you can't be requesting both an easement and a fence in the same area. So I'm thinking that the, the fence might, if, if you were to indulge my request, the fence may have to be backed up rather than hugging right along Albert Road. So I leave that for your consideration. Okay, Thank could you, you state your name and address, please? Uh, yes, I'm uh, Daniel Doobie, and I'm at uh, 7803 South 24th. She's South 23rd, I'm South 24th. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else uh, wishing to speak regarding items 12C and 12C1? Please come forward. I might just make a couple points of clarification. I'm going to close the public hearing yep. since I don't see anybody else coming forward. Uh, um, as far as the traffic analysis that's stated in the staff report, we specifically refer to the MAPA traffic map and those counts. When we don't have a MAPA traffic count, that's when it reflects no traffic data available. So it's specific to the MAPA 
data that we have from them. Um, also in regards to the fence that was brought up, that was not on the original site plan. That was part of the Planning Commission's recommendation. So that comes to you as a recommendation from Planning Commission. So it would be ultimately, again, up to City Council as part of site plan approval whether or not to include that fence on the south side of the development. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I didn't, uh, the gentleman, Mike, I, w I wasn't sure what's going on here. So he, there's a 48 apartment that would be like a single, sort of like what's just east to it. The Walnut Creek, is it going to be laid out like that? The site plan that's on the screen is is how it would look. It's 48 units. Um, that's the lot two. It's the RG20 PS component of the development that you folks are looking at tonight. The lot to the north, they're requesting a rezoning to BG PCO. The PCO piece of that would require further site plan approval. So to speak to Mr. Pricer's point earlier, at such time, they do have a developer. They would come back before the city council for approval of that commercial development. So that's why they're requesting that overlay um, that would also have site plan approval. So the main access for the apartments, yes, will be off of Albert. Um, the commercial lot to the north will have a restricted right in, right out onto Chandler, but will also have an easement along the south side that also goes out onto Albert Street to the south. I guess, so the 23rd Street, is that going to be the same street that is currently there serving the Walnut Creek like apartments? Or on the, on the north side? Well, so this development to the east is called Walnut Creek. Yes. It's one story. So are they going to share that road or is there going to be a no, new No, they're going to have a separate access. They're going to have a separate yes. road yes. that will run from Alberta. So Walnut to Creek, yeah, Walnut Creek has access off of South 23rd. This development will not. Um, a decision was made by the planning department and the engineering staff. Um, the original site plan for this development was approved back in 2006. At that time, the original site plan was for the lot that's highlighted in blue to be all RG20 PS and to accommodate over 200 units um, of multifamily. What the developer is asking is to subdivide the lot so that you would have the commercial lot at the corner of uh, 25th and Chandler and then uh, reserve the southern portion of the lot for multifamily residential. Now, the, the road that you see coming from Walnut Creek on the north side that has access to South 23rd that was originally um, designed to be connected to this development, but with um, the restriction that it only be for residential use. So since the developer is coming in with a commercial piece and a residential piece, um, we thought it was better to not have that connection based upon that restriction. Um, and then again, allow the restricted right in right out onto Chandler Road and then have the access to the south as well. Okay. So, could you go back to that diagram that had was outlined in blue, that was on the screen? Um, just from, so their road, where that outline is blue on the east side, they're gonna develop a brand new road that will go from the south to the north through that development and they will not connect or use the road that- Correct. Walnut Creek is correct. Are, okay. And with only 48 units, um, that connection is not necessarily needed. Again, this development was an originally engineered and the infrastructure was done to accommodate over 200 multifamily units on this property. Um, so another part of the piece of the BG PCO with the site plan approval is again, so that we can make sure so that the city has some say so as to how that is um, further developed and what that site plan looks looks like coming in for a commercial development. So the city will still ultimately have control over what that development piece looks like for the northern portion as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Tammy or anybody? Councilman Preister. Thank you, Mayor. It may be for Dean Dunn. I'll, I'll ask the two questions. The questions that I heard were one about a fence and whether or not there would be a a gate or any barrier that might be for the developer. Dean, the other question I heard was the right-of-way access, if that road is planned to be widened, 
and if it could be done on a particular side or not. I don't know that we're thinking about widening that at all. Well, Albert isn't. It's a residential standard street. It We wouldn't look to probably ever widen that. Okay. And it's not a single lane road, as I think was mentioned. It's a, like I said, residential standard two lane road. Sure. I so, think if there were cars parked there, it may have been. Now restricted. that's something that if it became a problem in the future, we could evaluate in house and look at the possible parking restrictions along it. Well, it sounds like he referred more to snow. I mean, we, do we get the snow off the road? Is there a problem? We don't pile it in the street, do we? No, usually snow in the residential areas gets pushed off behind the curb. Okay. Well, it might, it might be something we just need to pay attention to or take a look at, make sure we're getting that street cleaned yep. better in the wintertime. Sure. And then I thank you, Dean. I, I would ask the developer about the fence if there is any plans for that being a solid fence. Yeah, we we actually added the fence um, as a discussion with the homeowners association at planning commission meeting, and we do not intend to have any kind of gates or gaps in that fence except for uh, where our entrance is off Albert. We're, we're, we can't put a fence there, obviously. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councilwoman Welch. Just a question for Tammy, and you can shake your head one way or the other. You don't have to get up again. It, it sounds like what they're trying to do is get this rezoned for the potential of a developer coming in and developing it to commercial and multifamily. Is that correct? They already have a developer for the multifamily piece, so that's the site plan that you're seeing. So this request is a change of zone um, based on the replat of two lots, you know, the creation of an additional lot, and then the site plan approval for the apartments. They do not have a developer for the commercial piece yet, so they would come in under the requested change of zone, they would have to come back for site plan approval for the commercial piece, but they do have a developer for the multifamily. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and I would just add, if you do have snow issues, make sure you call our public works because we need to know about those when it happens, if you would. So, uh, we will have the third reading and vote on 12C and 12C1 on November 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers. Moves us to 12D, ordinance number 4016, an ordinance to amend sections 18 106 to 18 112 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to reserved spaces for handicapped persons. Susan, could you read that ordinance? Description, please. Ordinance number 4016, an ordinance to amend or revise certain ordinances as further detail herein, which has been affected by or generated by legislative changes and to add or change legislative citations to repeal such sections as heretofore existing and to provide for the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you, I'll open up item 12D for the public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak for or against? Ordinance number 4016, please come forward. Seeing nobody, I'll close the public hearing. The third reading and vote on 12D will be November 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Mr. Shannon has a comment on a proposed amendment for the third reading. He's gonna put it out there right now. Him and I discussed it. It's gonna be a good amendment. Um, and he just wants to put it out there in case anybody has anything to add prior to third reading. This is on 12D? Yeah. On 12D, on, yeah. Yeah, it's on 12D. Can you bring up the uh, ordinance, the second page? And paragraph 107D. Um, basically, we're gonna rewrite that paragraph to read, any person found guilty of a handicapped parking infraction shall be fined not more than $100 for the first offense, not more than 300 for second offense within one year, and not more than 500 for third or subsequent offenses within one year. 
that way we're just putting maximums in there, not minimums. I agree with what Mr. Shannon said as his proposal, except for the first one is not more than $150. Ah. And so we'll put that before you for third reading. We just wanted to make it known to the public that that was going to be the amendment and it's in line with um, what the handicap parking infraction statute is. Don't need to open up public hearing for that. Then. I think you did. Not with that yet. Not with the change, okay. All right. And I did say third reading will be on uh, November, 3rd. November 3rd on 12D, 2020 at 6 p.m. Item 12E, ordinance number 4003. Uh, we've got a request for continuance until December 1st by Mr. Kellner on behalf of the applicant. So I need a motion. I make a motion that we continue this item till December 1st. Second. Motion by Shannon, second by Preister to continue. Uh, Ordinance number 4003, December 1st, right? Yeah, December 1st, till December 1st. Yes. Uh, any comments or questions? Mayor. Yep. Thank you. I, I just got one. I don't know if anybody came tonight to speak on this. Uh, I don't think so. We have been putting, if we have a request and it's known prior, we put what's in red there that says request okay. for continuance so that people know that there's probably going to be a motion to continue. All right. Thank you. Okay. Motion by Shannon, second by Preister. Any further comments or questions? Mayor. Please vote. Councilman. In Preister. following up with Councilman Cook, we could just ask if anybody's here to testify, and that way we know that nobody did show up inadvertently. Okay. Is there anyone here to uh, speak uh, regarding ordinance number 4003 this evening? Okay, noted there is nobody coming forward. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, please vote for the continuance. All voting yes. Thank you. Item 13, ordinances for introduction. First reading, ordinance number 4019, an ordinance to amend section 6-22 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to restraint dogs. Susan, would you read that ordinance, please? Ordinance number 4019, an ordinance to amend section 6-22 of the Bellevue Municipal Code pertaining to restraint dogs to repeal such section as heretofore existing and to provide for the effective date of this ordinance. Thank you. Second reading and public hearing will be November 3rd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Item 14, public hearing on matters other than ordinances. 14A, request for a conditional use permit for lot two, one Cornhusker place to allow for automobile sales. Applicants James Howe and John Beckby for Tuffy Tire and Auto Service Location 2204 Pratt Avenue. Hello. How's it going tonight? <clears throat> Sorry to have you lap for last. It's okay. Yeah. It well, not last yet. But... Appreciate it. Who want to put a burn? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to open it up for public hearing and let the applicants speak first, but uh, item 14A is open for public hearing. Yep. Give us your idea. I uh, Mr. State your names and addresses first, please. James Howe, H-O-W-E, and um, I lived on um, 1209 Murray Point, Beaver Lake, Nebraska. John Beckby, B-E-C-K-B-Y, live at 21651 Chestnut Road, Council Bluffs, Iowa. Okay. So just a general description of what you're doing for the council and see if we have any questions. South, uh, southeast side of the parking lot towards the Burger King side nearest Pratt. Uh, just designate 10 uh, spots for uh, parking for sale vehicles. We feel that it's a, <clears throat> a great move uh, for our business. A lot of times we'll deal in a car that's left over or a customer wants to sell a car or trade a car or it just, it takes care of zoning uh, regulations. It gives us an extra uh, source of revenue. It helps a customer who may um, be ready to bail out of a car. We, we get a lot of that interaction already. 
And I just think it really, it, it won't uh, encumber the rest of the parking spots. There's 31 other spots for customers. It forces us to keep things moving and flowing. And okay. I just think it's a great move. Okay. I think uh, a lot of information in the pack. Any questions from the council for the applicants? Council Shannon? Yeah, I just wanted to comment and say that uh, having another activity in that area on Pratt uh, is good for all the businesses in that area because it just brings more traffic into that area mm -hmm. and, you know, brings more eyes. It's going to do more volume for the restaurants. I think it's I think it's a good move. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, just hold tight and we'll talk, see if there's anybody from the public. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak for or against the conditional use permit? Seeing nobody, I'll close the public hearing and uh, do I have a motion? Councilman Preister? Mayor, just a question before a okay. motion. And have you heard anything from your neighbors? You're not in a residential area, you're in a business or commercial area. So it seems appropriate, but I just wondered if you had any feedback from any. Our neighbors haven't, haven't said much. A lot of the neighbors come up there and, <clears throat> and work and they'll ask me, you know, do you know where there's a good car? Jim, timing chains out of this one. Do you know where there's a good car? We can buy them. And I'll call John and John will, he's been, how long have you been in car sales now, John? 25 years. 25 years and he'll locate something that's decent that I feel trustworthy. I can throw it on a hoist and look it over and it'd be a good value for the customer. And we started doing it and I got thinking that, that this is a great uh, revenue source. It's a great service for uh, people, you know, my, my daughter's up there, her car's junk, and we need it hauled off. Do you know where there's another car? We have 10 cars they can look at. Um, we could purchase that vehicle from them the right way through with a dealer license and a title, put it in that spot, repair it, put it back up for sale, or haul it to salvage. You know, it just it just tightens up everything. The, the neighbors seem to, a lot of the neighbors around the neighborhood ask me where we can find cars. Sure. So okay. we, think it's, we think it's good. It would be a good service for that spot. It's uh, worked well. It's going to help Thank a, lot you. Of, a lot of people. Yeah, and maybe I could hear from Miss Palm if she could come up to the mic. Excuse me, ma'am. I did have communication with the operating manager of Don and Millie's. He did get our zoning notice, and he had contacted me, just had a couple questions, and then told me that he was supportive of it. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. It is surrounded will, by commercial on yes. sides. So, yeah. yeah. I will make the motion then to uh, approve the I'll second. Motion by Preister, second by Shannon. Any further comments or questions? Please vote. All voting yes. You're good. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks, Thanks for everything you guys do. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Appreciate yep. it. Thanks. So 15 uh, resolutions, uh, we have none. 16 current business, uh, 16B approved contract with Dude Solution Inc. for the implementation of the SmartGov software application of the following development services processes, building permitting inspections, minimum housing enforcement, contractor licensing and financial connectors in an amount not to exceed $68,042.90. Take a motion. Councilman Stenson. I'll second that. Motion by Stenson, second by Welch. Any comments or questions? I feel like there should be at least one question. Mike stuck around this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> this will really bring us in line with the surrounding communities of uh, Omaha, Papillion. Sarpy County it will allow online permitting for electronically. You'll be able to follow it from the time you apply for the application all the way through the process. In real time, you'll see the inspection process, et cetera, in the plan review, online, online licensing, and so on. So we're up to the 19th century then? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Councilman Preister. And then I just have to appreciate the name. These are certainly code dudes. <laughs> Dude solution. 
Yes, it, it, it's uh, that's the software. Uh, it's actually the SmartGov is the the company itself. SmartGov okay. would be fun if it was Dude and Dudette. <laughs> dude, trying to have a little right. levity late at night. Motion by Shannon, second by Welch. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Motion by Oh. Right down here. All right. Motion by Stenson, seconded by Welch. Please vote. All voting yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, the motion was on 16C, which we moved earlier, so it's late. 16D, approve the purchase of a 2020 Pierce Impel Ascendant. 107 aerial unit from McQueen Emergency in an amount not to exceed $1,074,183. Is our chief here for questions? If we have any? Councilman Burns. Uh, no questions. I, I move we approve item 16D. Second. I'll second that. Burns, uh, motion by Burns, second by Welch. Any comments or questions? Okay, please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. 16E, approve and authorize the mayor to sign the lease purchase agreement for the leasing and subsequent purchasing of certain properties in Bellevue Sports Complex for the purpose of establishing and maintaining a six field athletic complex. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Council. I move that the city council go into a closed session at this time for the protection of the public interest. Subject matter to be discussed in closed session is real estate purchases. The following individuals will be included in the real estate, per in the real estate purchases. Mayor Rusty Hike, Jim Risto, Bob Stinson, Paul Cook, Pat Shannon, Don Preister, Thomas Burns, Kathy Welch, Bree Robbins, Tony King, Rich Severson, Mark Elbert, and Calm Brethna. And I need a second, please. Second. Motion by Welch, seconded by Shannon to go into closed session. Please vote. All voting yes. Thank you. Colonel Dayton, can you uh, still hear me? <laughs> All right. You don't have to. Thank you for coming out. And uh, you picked a good one. Remind you of boot camp at all. Thanks for what you do. Thanks. Can we, can we run to a restroom real quick? We did, but. No.
<laughs> this is normal for our business, though. <laughs> Nights and endurance. Yep, absolutely. Sounds like sports. Are we live? Anybody get the message? Yep, we're getting live. All right. So it is 9.52, and we have returned from closed session. I had a motion by Shannon, seconded by Pricer, to return to regular session. Please vote. So we are uh, back in regular session and we are on 16E um, where then that is uh, approve and authorize the mayor to sign the lease purchase agreement for the leasing and subsequent purchasing of certain properties in Bellevue Sports Complex for the purpose of establishing and maintaining a six field athletic complex. So Councilman Pricer. Thank you, Mayor, uh, to start our discussion and I'm pleased to make the motion to approve 16E, authorizing you to sign the lease purchase agreement for this property, the Bellevue Sports Complex. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion by Pricester, seconded by Cook to approve 16E. And do we have any comments or questions from the council? I would like to hear from the operators and okay. get a little information about what you plan. All right, Sean Johnston, 7001 North 153rd Street, Bennington, Nebraska. Um, a little bit background about myself. I was an educator in Miller Public Schools, um, was a coach, was a sports official, um, got married, had kids, had to make a decision of what to cut out of my life. Um, wound up being a, a retired stay-at-home dad, started my own uh, sports officials business, Premier Sports Officials Association. Um, it's been very successful created a lot of relationships with coaches and organizations from all around the Midwest. Um, Brandon sure I'll have him introduce himself here in a little bit, came to me with a business plan of bringing what I do with sports officials, what he does with uh, sports apparel, and inviting um, teams to a six field complex in Bellevue, Nebraska, and uh, bringing economic prosperity to the city uh, that's needed on those six fields. So that's sort of my background, that's sort of our Small vision right now. Brandon? Um, Brandon Schur. Um, I live at uh, 14 720 uh, Gertrude Street, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, like Sean said, I guess I, um, I've i owned my own apparel business for a few years now. I also run youth bass pitch tournaments. I'm the assistant state director for USSSA, which is a major um, sanction here in Nebraska. Um, so I've been running events now for three, four years, four years um, total, um, three years on my own. Uh, I've, I've worked with Sean for a long time. Uh, that's kind of where I brought him in. He knows a lot of the official side of things. Um, he does a lot on the baseball end. I do a lot on the softball end as well as obviously, you know, apparel, just kind of other things to um, kind of grow the experience when kids come out to play. Um, so I guess, you know, like Sean said, that's kind of our, our small vision on um, what we can do uh, for the city of Bellevue, but also just in how we can bring those six fields um, kind of back to life a little bit. Now your visions of grandeur, uh, that's the basic uh, vision, but you, a little bit beyond that, maybe sometime in the future? Yep, absolutely. Okay, good. I, I just questions? What are you gonna call the complex? So we're gonna call the complex Premier Sports Village. Um, you know, sort of the idea of it takes a village to raise, raise a kid. And I know sports is a small aspect of it, and we just want to be part of it. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. it'll be a nice addition to Bellevue. I think it's got lots of potential, and I certainly am glad you thought of us and wish you well. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, motion by Shannon, seconded by. No, that's not right. Motion by Pricester, seconded by. Cook. Cook. Oh, I must have been Long dreaming day. or something. <laughs> motion by Pricester, seconded by Cook. Uh, please vote. Did somebody yell play ball when we're 
<laughs> just going to do that. He oh, took it from me. All voting yes. All right. Thank you. Play ball. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, takes us to 17 administration reports. Uh, those reports are given at the first council meeting of every month. Um, and I will take a motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Welch, seconded by Burns to adjourn. I'm not going to take any comments or questions on that. Please vote. All voting yes.